Okay, so we still have a number of people joining us, so I'm going to wait for one or two minutes before we start. It's up to you. Okay, I suggest that we start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jose Manuel Campa, and I'm the chair of the European Banking Authority. I have great pleasure welcoming you to the second day of the joint ISAS High Level Conference on Financial Education and Literacy. I'm sure many of you have attended the event yesterday, which saw two fantastic speeches, I think, by the United Nations Secretary General and Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. And by May, May Reed McGuinness, our EU Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability, and the Capital Markets Union. There were so many important messages that it's difficult for me to pick a few that are more relevant than others. But allow me to refer to just two of them. One was that we heard that having a population with good financial health is in the interest of financial supervisory authorities, as people with good financial health are more resilient and better equipped to size opportunities and rebound from economic downturns. Another message that we heard was that it's critical to design more effective interventions on financial education and financial behavior, and that it's important to assess firms' new business models, products, and services, along with their effects on the financial health. There are very important takeaways. For, these are very important takeaways for the three ESAs, and will give us cause to think what this should mean for the way we fulfill our mandates going forward. Following those two speeches, we then heard in the first section on financial education and capital markets union about the EU Commission's action plan on the capital markets union and that it aims at making the EU a safer place for individuals to save and invest. The session provided concrete solutions to foster the financial literacy of consumers and make the, the action plan a reality for all of us. The discussion has allowed the three ESAs to gather further input on how better to fulfill the respective mandates to coordinate national education initiatives and to contribute to the action plan of the Commission. In the second session, we then discussed the challenges that financial institutions and public authorities are facing in educating consumers about potential threats, scams, frauds, and cybersecurity in general. We heard about the several hundred national education initiatives that the ESAs have published this week in an online repository, which is publicly available and shows the diverse ways through which national authorities educate consumers, including in, relations, in relation to scams and fraud. We also heard about two-factor authentication, which is a particular security requirement that has been implemented through EU law in recent years to reduce payment fraud. This requirement probably impacts all of us, for example, with access our payment accounts or pay via cars online. We were pleased to hear that two-factor authentication appears to have the desired effect of reducing payment fraud which it has been at least 40 to 60% reduction, and we have the expectation that this may still drop further as SCA, as SCA becomes more widespread. However, we also heard that not all consumers were adequately aware and prepared for these additional requirements, which suggests that more needs to be done to educate consumers about similar such initiatives in the future. Now, let me allow, allow me now to turn to today's program. You know, it gives me great pleasure to welcome in a few minutes Stephanie John Cortan, who is Vice President of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and a substitute member of the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee at the European, Par at the European Parliament. She will start the proceedings for today by providing us a keynote address with some very important messages. Following her speech, we will continue with the third session of the conference, which will be about financial education and financial resilience of vulnerable groups. The session will be moderated by Fausto Porente, the Executive Director of EOPA, 
and the inside speech will be provided by Ana Maria Luzardi, professor at the George Washington University Business School. The panelists will discuss that the vulnerability of individuals, communities, and the environment is a major driver of individuals' enhanced exposure to financial risks. The session then will focus on how financial education can support financial resilience, including respect to savings, investments, insurance, and pensions, and the discussion will hopefully allow the ESAs to gain a better understanding of the risks that some financial communities might, consumers might incur. The fourth and final session for this <coughs> conference will be about financial education and sustainable finance, and will be moderated by Dr. Jacob Toma, which is the Executive Director of Two Degrees Investing Initiative. Following an inside speech by Professor Kern Alexander of the University of Zurich, the panelists will then discuss the large number of new sustainable financial products and services that are emerging in the market and that influence greatly many aspects of personal finance. The session will explore the new learning and education needs of individuals that these products are creating and how they could be best be met. So this promises to be another exciting day and I hope you will all enjoy it at least as much as I enjoyed yesterday. Let us now start with the keynote speech for today. Andy John Corden, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Muchísimas gracias, Presidente. Dear uh, querido José Manuel. Good afternoon to all the participants and, and many thanks to the um, joint ESAS for their really kind invitation to deliver uh, this keynote speech. I'm, I'm really delighted to be uh, amongst many distinguished um, speakers yesterday and today and to debate one of the most important topics to create a real new European economic model, basically financial education and financial literacy. In other words, how can citizens play an active role in managing their savings? How can their savings and how can these savings be mobilized to the benefit of our common European priorities between transitions, climatal, climate, climate, sorry, I to the, gather them all, climate, climate and digital and European autonomic strategy. You know, financial education ten, can take many shapes and forms. Financial education is teaching your children how to manage their pocket money. Financial education is uh, adding basic financial skills to the school curricula. Financial education is encouraging your teenagers to look for funding for their own project, for a trip, for example. But still today, financial education is not considered what it should be, a lifelong learning adventure that does not stop when you turn 18. To change this perception, I would suggest that we talk about financial coaching. Financial coaching can happen at university, at the workplace, and in many other social occasions. Financial coaching can involve teachers, employers, trade unions, NGOs, local associations, associations, and of course, the traditional financial advisors, whether they are banks, insurance brokers, or anywhere else, offline and offline and online. Well, our objective is clear. The citizens should be aware of the power of their savings and should be coached to use it to the best of their ability. Beyond this important discussion uh, between experts, we all, we all, definitely all can act towards this objective and let citizens know that we are acting all together. However, to make financial education and coaching work, I believe we need to understand first the motivation driving citizens to save and or not to save. That is the question. Uh, second, the ways in which we can align these savings with our European priorities. Third, understand also the actions we can take to empower citizens to become active financial citizens. And, and fourth, the initiatives that we can advance as European co-legislators. First question, very briefly, what are the drivers for savings? In more detail, what are the incentives for citizens to save for their retirement and for other life goals? Still today, saving for retirement is more a uh, one-off decision for citizens and very dependent on national incentives, taxation in most parts. And on the other hand, it can be seen as uh, good news. It shows that citizens are mostly confident that public pensions will be appropriate. 
Um, it also creates a disconnect between citizens and their saving and their money for the future. So recreating this link between citizens and their savings is more than ever necessary if we want to mobilize the money. Of course, we should not undo completely the carefully calibrated social provision systems strongly rooted uh, in national cultures. Well, I don't know if you if you see me, maybe not because it seems we have a, a trouble on the uh, on the screen. But as long as Stephanie, we see you, we see you, we we'll hear you perfectly so far. Or at least uh, I see you, hear you perfectly. So okay, problem. sorry because I, there was a um, a black screen. So sorry. So well, I think much. Uh, and more can be done. I would just like to take one example. It's the, the one from France, the Plan d'épargne retraite, the PER, uh, in the Loi Pact is shining illustration of a great solution to incentivize um, long term uh, savings and channel it towards financial um, and financing the economy. Only two years after the launching, the PER is uh, already part of uh, the habits for French citizens and has led to more conversation on how they best use their savings. We should also look at the financial coaching role usually devoted to financial advisors. Clarifying their role to avoid conflict of interest is a must and I hope future Commission initiative on this topic will be ambitious. This could uh, also, I think, open up a societal discussion on, on who can be involved in financial coaching. As mentioned before, I think we can mobilize all active forces of society. Second question, how can we align savings with our European priorities? I think it's important to clearly focus on that. Uh, say differently, how can these incentive, incentives align with the general objectives of the EU, namely sustainability, digitization, and autonomic strategy. In the short term, I believe we should focus on incentives for institutional investors, banks, insurers, investment funds. The institution of intermediated finance are still the orders still of citizen saving. For example, the review of the Solvency II directive and the new banking package will ensure that insurers and banks take the whole part in mitigating the impact of climate change and in helping our society, societies, societies sorry, to adapt. Similarly, we need banks and insurers to harness the potential uh, that digitalization offers for their operation while preserving their resilience. So reinforcing the role of our banks and our insurers in the twin transition will in turn reinforce our strategic autonomy. Our new European economic model will be built on a strong public and private European financing capacity. This will lead to more influence on our European destiny from an economic and geo geopolitical point of view. So uh, this is why we need to start now to recreate the contract of confidence between consumers and the financial ecosystem. Uh, this is the main topic of my third point. How can we empower citizens to become active consumers for financial products? What needs to change at the point of sale to empower citizens to become active consumers or consume actor in French? Uh, this brings, uh, uh, brings me to, to many questions on the distribution of financial products, transparency, corporate governance, among others. On the distribution of financial products, I think much can be done to turn the point of sale into a point of dialogue. Uh, financial intermediaries should look to co-building saving strategies together with consumers um, rather than offering ready-made packages and products and uh, they should foster regular dialogue with each other rather than relying on, on passive disclosure. On transparency, uh, I think we should move from a compliant driven approach when consumers are given a pile of static documents which can discourage them from saving. I, I, I very much support a dialogue-driven approach with interactive uh, um, um, information accessible to consumers. And in this way, our consumers would have at their fingertips to, the ability to choose investments in line with our European strategy. 
and priorities also. And in turn, this new dialogue driven approach will build a more direct link between citizens and the companies they invest in. With more and more interest in corporate activity across the globe, I think we will offer possibility for citizens to directly influence the activities of the companies they invest in. In political speech, uh, we often talk about voting with your feet when uh, citizens uh, abstain. Consumers are also more and more boycotting some products and companies. Um, with revision to, to corporate governance, I think we could offer them the possibility to use the power of their savings to change companies rather than just having a yes or no option. This brings me to the last and fourth question, what's next? How can the forthcoming European Commission's retail investment strategy deliver on these changes? Without going into all the legal details, I can already quote a number of European directives and regulations that would require amendments to deliver on the ambitions I've outlined. PRIPS, MIFID and IDD for financial distribution and, and, and transparency, CSRD, maybe SFDR and the taxonomy, and of course, the future sustainable corporate governance initiative for corporate governance. I'm conscious that these questions are horizon for the 10 years ahead. Unfortunately, the European decision-making process forces us to think in five-year circle or even shorter in this exceptional COVID period. So launching the questions now is, is the only way, I think, to make sufficient progress in time and speed up the pace of the capital markets union. This is why I call on the Commission to be ambitious in its future retail investment strategy. You can be sure that the European co-legislator, especially the European Parliament, will push for more ambition. In short, I believe financial education or financial coaching goes hand in hand with the trust in the financial ecosystem. This trust will improve if the financial ecosystem is seen to contribute to our common European priorities, climate, digital and autonomy. With this trust, will come a renewed sense of empowerment for citizens that their savings can change the world around them. Many thanks to all of you and I look forward to listening to your fruitful panel discussion. Again, muchísimas gracias, Presidente Campa. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Montan. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks and insights. It's a really pleasure and honor to have you with us. Um, it's very encouraging to see your commitment and your clear messages that the European Parliament will push for an ambitious uh, agenda on the retail investment strategy, you know, and that will provide a sense of empowerment to citizens, which I like very much, you know, that their savings can change the world around them. And that it's important that they are active because they can, they can also help address the larger challenges confronting us that you were very well pointed on digital environment and other issues. I also appreciate very much your emphasis on lifetime learning. As, part, as, an, as an important part of the uh, financial education process. As you called it, if I'm not mistaken, you called it coaching, lifetime coaching rather than learning, which is a, a very interesting, uh, I think, twist. And also the need to mutate financial institutions from a sales mindset at the point of sale into a dialogue mindset with their customers to better address and understand their needs. So I really appreciate it. I think those are very important messages that will help us as we shape our work going forward for the ESAS. So thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. It's really, really, really has really been a pleasure and I really appreciate it. Now, let me pass the floor now to Fausto, who will be moderating the first panel as I indicated in my initial remarks. Fausto, very nice to see you. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Jose Manuel. And um, thanks a lot to Madame Stephanie Jon Corten, who excellent, uh, inspiring speech. Uh, I also took some note, um, financial coaching, uh, the three points, um, very interesting. But let me now welcome you to this panel, which is uh, on, as uh, Jose Manuel already announced, is on financial education and financial resilience of the vulnerable groups. Yesterday, we heard about uh, the fast pace of technology and how this is changing the way we spend, that we save money, and how people can be subject to scam and fraud. But digitalization is actually not uh, the only challenge, challenge that the, the vulnerable group uh, may face. They may have difficulty to access even basic financial services like uh, bank account or loans or, or saving for retirement, uh, services that are uh, 
let's say for for most of the people uh, normal feature in they in the in their day-to-day uh, -day life uh, we need to we need to pay attention to to those uh, vulnerable group we need to make sure that we don't leave those group behind so the panel will focus on the specific needs for those vulnerable group for those um, minority group and how financial education is key to ensure that uh, a more resilient and inclusive society is um, can be can be set up why because it, because the consumer we we have said this along uh, even the, the president panel and Jose Manuel already highlighted it better financial education can make more uh, uh, responsible financial decision to assure that every consumer can um, can can have their financial health ensured in the long uh, term and also via this more responsible financial decision they contribute they can contribute to more inclusive and resilient world i want to quote the commissioner mcginnis uh, words yesterday when she said that a financial literate person can use finance to meet his goal in life and this can have a positive outcome for all the aspects of our society to deal with the topic, we have invited four um, excellent uh, panelists, uh, complementary background, different area of expertise to discuss the topic, to discuss how financial education can support financial health and resilience. But before giving the floor and because, before entering into the panel itself, um, I want to welcome uh, Anna Maria Luzardi, professor of uh, economics and accounting in uh, George Washington University, academic director of the Global Financial Literacy Excellence uh, Center and director of the Italian Financial Education Committee. Anna Maria will uh, open the session with a presentation on insight on financial literacy and financial fragility. I know that there are some slides that she can use. Anna Maria, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for this invitation. I am delighted to be here um, and to talk about such an important topic. I was uh, listening yesterday uh, to the conference and I have to say this is uh, a very uh, impressive conference where we can all learn a lot about how, for example, to move forward. Uh, let me share my presentation, which is um, taking um, a dynamic perspective uh, and let me, I can put it in the mode. Um, it's going to take a, a perspective of let's look at changes over time. Um, so I think we can learn a little bit more about what's happening and in particularly um, the need for intervention. Um, I want to focus a lot on vulnerable group as the title of this session. Um, and, and I think the main message is we need to invest in this group in order for everybody to do better. Having a financially literate population the benefits not just the vulnerable groups, but everybody. And then the importance of boosting financial resilience, because even when the economy does well, uh, not everybody is able to even face a shock. Um, I'm going to do so by uh, providing new data that we have been collected, um, collecting each year uh, since um, 2016. Um, and I want to introduce what we call the TIA Institute GFLAC Personal Finance Index. This is an extended measure of financial literacy. It covers all of the decisions that people regularly make uh, in their life. And so it covers as many as eight topics and it provides us a very granular overview of what people know and do not know when we talk about finance. As I've mentioned, we have been collecting this year since 2017. So we have an opportunity, for example, to look at data before and after some big events and we didn't have to wait a long time for some big events to happen. But most importantly, um, each year we have also collected data on some specific groups, so we could zoom in in some of those groups. So we have collected data uh, on Hispanics, uh, millennials, African Americans, women, and different generations. And I'm going to speak a little bit about each of them today. 
Um, as I've mentioned, uh, and if you are familiar with some of the uh, question I have designed in the past, like the big three of the big five, this is uh, much more extensive. We cover uh, eight topics. And this would be the topics, for example, that one teach in a personal finance course, but most importantly, they are related to the decisions that people make um, and many of the decisions that we have been discussing in this conference, for example, saving decision, investment decisions, uh, insurance, and so on. And uh, um, I want to show you the findings so far, and there are two main messages just, just from this uh, okay. uh, first uh, a look at the data. Um, when we look overall at how much people know, I would say that um, we, the, this is of course the, just the US experience, and I want to focus on the US because this is the country with the most developed financial markets. So let's look at how much the population knows. And as you can see, there is um, a limited financial knowledge. If you only get 50% of the questions in my test, you don't really get a, a, even a C or a D, you get an F. And this is, I think, what is uh, the most important finding here, which is you know, just the level of financial literacy is low. And there is also a percentage of the population that you see here, one in five American cannot even answer seven of the 28 questions that we have designed. So not just the financial literacy is low, but it's particularly low among some groups. Um, but the other most important finding is that financial literacy is not improving over time. It's not that you can rely on crises or on big events um, so that people become more financially literate. I always say it's not that you become financially literate by watching the world around you. So we really need intervention, which is my first message. Um, let's look at what are the topics that people know the most and the least. And this is, I think, the second important finding, which is that the topics that people really know the least is comprehending risk. It is about insurance. It is about investing. And this is worrisome because, of course, you know, we are now dealing even more with risk. Um, and this corresponds to finding from many other surveys. If you look at the big three or the big five, if you are familiar with those measures of financial literacy, there as well, the message is the topics that people know the least is risk and managing risk. Um, well, given that we are in the middle of the pandemic, um, you know, this is another call for action. Um, not only people know this topic the least, but this topic, this uh, little knowledge has been remained stable yet again over time. So this topic has been disproportionately what people know the least. Um, and um, uh, we, because we can collect data each year, we have been able to uh, add a new questions in the past two years. Um, and I want to report yet another statistics that we have added to the survey. As you know, almost every night we are provided information on the pandemic and we are providing data on, for example, probabilities. You know, we are providing data of how many number of people are infected and so on. And so we ask people a simple questions about the probability. What is the, you know, which, which of these uh, for example, number indicate a higher probability of getting a particular disease. And again, this is related with how much people understand risk. And as you can see here, very much related to the situation we are in today, you know, 28% are able to answer these questions. And in fact, half of the population say, I don't, I don't even know um, the answer to these questions. And you know, we, we talk about people taking calculated risk. Well, you know, people need to be able to calculate before we uh, uh, show them the risk and, you know, they really need to be able to interpret this. Um, and I hope this uh, resonates and I hope that in particular in the middle of a financial crisis of this proportion, you know, we can think a little bit more about how to empower people uh, to better manage the risk and to understand it. Let me turn to the vulnerable groups, uh, and here there is uh, there are two important messages I would like to give. One is that the vulnerable groups in financial literacy are already vulnerable by themselves. They are, for example, those with lower income, lower education, and without a job. 
So, um, you know, let's, uh, uh, let's think about this because uh, we need to think not just about, um, uh, we need to talk also about equity when we uh, think about financial literacy. And uh, I also want to focus on some uh, large group in the population, which are also displaying low financial literacy. I want to spend a little bit more attention on a group, which I think is particularly important and which are women. Almost in every country, not just in the US, there is a gender difference in financial literacy. Women know much less than men. And as you can see here, there is also a high proportion, a higher proportion of women in the lowest group. Um, women are not a minority, they are half of the population. So I think if one had to start about focusing on vulnerable groups, I would recommend starting with women. Also because there is a multiplier effect when you focus on women. When women are more financially literate, there is actually a spillover and an effect on other group of the population. So if there is a group to invest, I think this is the one. There are large differences across race and ethnicity. And as you can see, there are large differences, for example, uh, among white, African-American and Hispanics. And as you can see, some of the groups that display lowest financial literacy are disproportionately, for example, the African-Americans in the US. And then when we turn to a very important groups, and I want to focus here on the young and the old, you can see that the young have lower financial literacy and they have lower financial literacy because they are young. Uh, but there is no excuse here because we can reach this group uh, because this group disproportionately, for example, is in school or in college or it has been in school and in college. So this is something I think we can fix. I also want to talk about the older group because what this data shows is that even after we look at people who have made many financial decisions, even those close to retirement, they don't have high level of financial literacy. So yet again, don't assume that because people have made decisions that their level of financial literacy is particularly high and thinking of the many decisions that people have to make in this stage of the life cycle, for example, how to accumulate their wealth, you know, they are entering that stage with a relatively limited measure of financial literacy. So, you know, we shouldn't uh, disregard any group in terms of age, uh, when we look at the level of financial literacy and potential intervention. And here is another finding which is important to consider. Over time, who is acquiring, who is getting better? And this is again coming back to the issue of equity. Uh, left to themselves is the people with higher education, those who are exposed to financial education, and those who have a job which are displaying higher financial literacy over time. So left to itself, the system becomes more unequal. And I hope yet again, the policymaker are taking notice uh, because this is what will happen if we don't make uh, take actions and if we don't empower everybody in the population to be more financially literate. Why does financial literacy matter? I want to look at one indication of uh, well-being. I prefer well-being to financial health somehow, but uh, I just want to look, for example, at the capacity of people to face um, a small size shock and is indicated in $2,000 or think of 2,000 euro. And this is important because it gives us an, an idea of whether people are indeed resilient, you know, can go through life without being derailed just by a, not a pandemic, but potentially a small shock. So this is how we define people who are not um, financially resilient, which is, you know, not able to just face a small shock. And I want to show you how this has changed over time. We designed these questions at the wake of the financial crisis in 2008. And at that time, one in two Americans would not have been able to face a shock. As you can see, financial fragility has decreased over time um, because of course the economy was doing better. But one of the things I want to show you is that in January 2020, well before the start of the pandemic, when the economy in the US was at its all time high, so the unemployment was 4%. The stock market was uh, shooting up. 
In fact, almost a third, you know, 27% of Americans would not have been able to face a small shock. Yet again, it's not that the economy, when it does well, lifts all boats in terms of personal finance. Um, and I think this is, again, the fact that, you know, if you improve income, it doesn't mean that people are doing better in their personal finances. And I hope that this message resonates, which is that we also need to empower people to take good care of their finances. And this is, uh, by the way, not just a, a topic of the US, but it's also a topic of Europe. Um, so we have replicated this data in Europe. And as you can see, in fact, more or less a third of European would not have been able to face an expected financial expense in 2008. 18, which was a period of moderate growth in the US. Um, why, how can we do that? I want to show you that financial literacy is very strongly linked to financial fragility. So people who have higher financial literacy are much better able to prepare for the unexpected. And it's not just, um, you know, even if I account for all of the characteristics, you know, it's not that because these people are disproportionately high income or high education, even if I account for that, you can see that financial literacy measure in many, way, uh, many ways, you know, is linked to financial fragility. I want to look at, uh, allow you to look at this particular parameter. I want to show you that here that if people are offered financial education, you know, there is not a stronger link to financial resilience. Why? Because a lot of the financial education program, and these are mostly financial education offered at the workplace, do not cover actually, uh, you know, um, short term savings. They tend to cover long term savings. And again, I think, you know, when we need to empower people um, to think about the personal finances, I think it's really important that we empower them to think about a range of topics, not just, for example, saving for retirement. Uh, but because saving for retirement is so important, let me also show you very briefly that those who are more financially literate are much more able to save for retirement on a regular basis. And they have, as you can see, disproportionately much more likely to have plan for retirement. And this is also true if I account for all of the demographic characteristics. It's not that because people who are financially literate, as you know, they are also uh, not vulnerable groups. They are more likely to have high income, higher education, and have a job. If I account for that, even if I look at the people who, who have all uh, high income, high education, and so on, actually, if you are more financially literate, you are also much more likely to save for retirement. And here, financial education is very effective because normally saving for retirement is covered in many of the financial education program. Let me conclude with some of the work we have done in Italy with the Italian Financial Education Committee. This is a committee which is evidence based. And so one of the things we have done is we have collected data so we understand what the situation in Italy is and we can design programs which are targeted to the vulnerable group in the population. And one of the things we have uh, learned by looking at the data, for example, last year during a pandemic is yet again, this very strong link between financial literacy and financial fragility. So what we say in this report is that financial literacy acted like a shield to protect people against shock. And I want to leave you with this image. This is what financial literacy can be. It helps people, you know, to go in life a little bit more protected. So to conclude, uh, my main point is that we need to improve level of financial literacy. It's not going to increase by itself. We need intervention in school, in the workplace where people go to learn. Um, and if we don't do this, we are going to be bound to be even more unequal. Uh, it's important to focus more than ever uh, on risk and risk diversifications because this is where people know the most and uh, risk has become a feature of our life. Uh, risk has increased uh, a lot and people need to be able to protect themselves against risk. And we need to boost financial resilience as well. Even in good times, you know, people are not even able to face a shock. And it has to do with the fact that people often do not have the knowledge and skills to be able to do so. So, you know, data can be important to design those programs. And I look forward to um, initiatives that do so. Certainly, we are trying to do that in Italy. 
just a, a final thing here is uh, the data provided the, the 28 question we design. These are questions we have designed for the US and are very specific for some of the experience we have uh, done here. So they are proprietary. You know, you don't uh, find them on our website, but we are very happy to work with you and design questions which are appropriate, for example, to design policy in Europe. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Anna Maria. Very inspiring uh, and uh, full of. Uh, data evidences which is what uh, what we need uh, in this uh, in this area so very very interesting thanks a lot financial uh, i heard that financial literacy is holding steady which is uh, a call for action clearly uh, for us for everybody large uh, variation in the financial uh, literacy across across demography you mentioned uh, women uh, young old um, poor people, so a lot of uh, vulnerable group. First the task could be to identify who we want to target, as you mentioned, one, one of the first tasks. Clear link between uh, financial literacy and financial fragility evidenced by, by data, which is, let's say, clearly a message for us to, to pay attention. Financial literacy and retirement planning is also another another um, clear relationship that we need to pay attention to very 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 interesting i like also the the image you want to you know in the insurance sector we have this image you know the shield to protect the people but this here is more wider financial literacy to to protect against the financial shock thanks a lot um, thanks a lot again and uh, let me just mention now the, this is a topic which, of course, uh, is uh, high in our uh, in our um, uh, attention in our agenda. We know that financial exclusion uh, uh, affects uh, wide sector, also in the EU population. You mentioned some data also on the EU side, and we also know that the pandemic has made things uh, even worse. Million million of people, million of citizens uh, face difficulty. I know I want to quote the World Bank estimate that around 100 million people fell into poverty because of the pandemic in 2020. And research shows that most people think they are 90 days from exhausting their savings. And that this perception can even be wrong, it can even be worse, because when the financial shock re materialized, they may experience that they the, the gap between prosperity and poverty is even uh, smaller than what they were thinking about. And financial health, uh, health is also linked to, to mental health, I, I want to stress. Uh, people uh, with financial worries are four times more likely to be suffering from anxiety and panic attack, and five times more likely to be suffering from depression. So. It's key to act, it's key to, to make uh, our best effort. How we can improve uh, financial health? Well, along two lines, I, I would say, better design the product that satisfy consumer needs. And this is more a call from the player in the market, but also, and this is the topic of today panel, financial education, more and more financial education to let them understand, let people understand which product they might um, need, which product best suit their needs. So our global vision would be to have a, a financially inclusive uh, union where financial services are acceptable, easy to, easy to use, meet uh, people's need uh, along all the, the lifetime, and where everybody bad, body has the skill, the motivation. You also mentioned the motivation to make uh, use of them. But the problem is how we can get there. The vision is clear how we can get there. For this, um, for this we have our panelists. Let me introduce them. I have um, the pleasure to introduce Anne-Sophie Parent, former Secretary General of Age Platform Europe, a network of uh, non-profit organization for promoting and um, uh, man managing the senior people uh, needs people more than 50, I, I know. The second uh, panelist is uh, Magda Bianco, Head of Consumer Protection and Financial Education Department in the Bank of Italy. We will share with her 
some experience from the Italian market already mentioned by the Professor Lusardi. Then we have Michaela Kohler, Director General of Insurance Europe, representing uh, one important player in the, in the market, the insurance sector. And Peter Simon, Managing Director of the World Saving and Retail Banking Institute and the European Saving and Retail Banking Group, which would represent another important player in the market. Let me start with some question actually as a reaction, if I may say so, to the presentation we heard, the interesting presentation from, uh, from uh, the Professor Lusardi. Um, maybe I will start with Anne Sophie and then Michaela, Peter, and Magda. Uh, Anne Sophie, what is your um, reaction to what you heard about the, the study, the, the insight? And where do you see the, the issue of vulnerability impacting the, a, a, the, the senior? part of our population, if I may ask you, please. Thank you, Fausto. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you, Ana Maria. It was really a very, uh, very interesting presentation uh, full of uh, data that we can indeed use here in Europe. Uh, I, I know we have very limited time, so I just first of all want to say that I fully agree with your recommendation that if one group has to be singled out, it's not a minority group, it's women and not enough is done for women regarding financial education and building their financial resilience. And this is even more uh, so true for older women in particular, because they have faced disadvantage in accessing education, even if their parents may have uh, had good uh, income, they were not necessarily encouraged to uh, achieve higher education. And uh, with the accumulated impact they have had all uh, throughout their life course, of course, they are at disadvantage. I'm not saying the other group should not be addressed, but I'll come back on that later on. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anne Sophie. Michaela, your stake from uh, from an insurance uh, perspective, if I may. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Anna Maria, for this very interesting presentation. I am naturally concerned when I look at uh, your slides and where you point out that, you know, the lowest level uh, or the highest level of concern is with the low levels of risk comprehension and, and insurance, obviously. I think when uh, we look at risk awareness, this is really crucial for many, but it is clearly um, even a bigger problem for vulnerable people. And we know uh, for years that it is vital to reduce protection gaps and to build resilience. And just giving you three examples, we, we will certainly talk about pension later on because we have a problem that uh, generally uh, people are not saving either at all or not enough. We have on the natural catastrophe side also obviously the development that we have more severe and more frequent events. Already. And we have seen this year, uh, certainly last year, how, you know, an event uh, overnight, uh, a climate event can uh, take away lifetime savings. And that really is an issue that needs to be addressed where risk awareness is, is crucial. And with the increasing uh, trend towards digitalization, we also obviously need to look at you know, resilience and vulnerability um, in the context of cyber risks, fraud and scam. I think from the insurance sector, the message is we are ready partners to engage in this discussion. Our members are very active at national level, you know, in um, and engaged in uh, risk awareness exercises. As Insurance Europe, we also have our insurance insure wisely campaign. So I'm very keen and looking forward to the discussion we will have uh, to address some of the, the points and fully share uh, Anne Sophie's point also about vulnerability of, of female. And I have also some data on that later. Thanks a lot. Yes, Peter, from uh, the banking side. Yes, uh, first, thank you very much to Anna Maria Luzardi. Her work is really inspiring. Uh, she has uh, dedicated a lot of her time to financial inclusion and events on financial education. This report on financial well being in the pandemic um, is no exception. However, um, it's important to point out um, uh, for us here that the question who is 
vulnerable um, changes as times are changing. So uh, if you would have asked perhaps two years before if a hair cutter belongs to a group of vulnerable people, you would have clearly answered with no, because people go from time to time always to uh, have their hairs cut. Then a pandemic came and suddenly the hair cutters were closed for weeks or months. And uh, um, as we all know that uh, most of them earn not this much, uh, we had uh, problematic situations here in many households living from this business. This is a very small uh, example. Uh, also the question around what is the risk for elderly people? You would have answered the question, are they especially vulnerable 20 years, 15 years before, completely different than uh, today, because the digitalization played no role or only a minor role in these days. What do I want to say? Uh, the question, uh, who are the most vulnerable, has to be answered every day on the basis of an everyday evaluation and cannot be seen as something static. Yeah, thanks, uh, Drew. Uh, but also I remember one point of Mrs. Lusardi point that financial literacy or illiteracy is block basically is not improving in general but anyway magda maybe your um, your point of view we know that in italy we have been you have been working a bit especially on the impact uh, of the pandemic so what what's your view on this can you can you mention some of you, the priority you took Thank you, Fausto, and thank you, Anna. Actually, we did work with Anna a lot on this, so I, I can share uh, about uh, I can share some some of the the thoughts that she presented already. Um, well, I, I would like to continue uh, on what has just been said. That actually the pandemic um, increased vulnerabilities everywhere, of course, as Anna showed, um, especially among those who were somehow already socially and economically vulnerable. But it increased inequalities under a lot of dimensions, uh, uh, changing dimensions compared to the past. So we have, uh, for example, younger households, especially those with school age children or households uh, with uh, uh, with a head of foreign origin, those with lower educational attainment, uh, the unemployed, or those uh, in the in the private sector compared to the public sector. Um, so it, it, it varied a lot, or the manufacturing less heat compared to the service sector. So there has been a lot of dimensions um, that were differently hit by the pandemic and became more vulnerable, as has been said. But then, of course, uh, we have also major groups which have been hit uh, strongly. Anna mentioned, of course, women. Uh, we have data. Uh, we have data from the, from the um, uh, from the evidence that she mentioned. We also have Bank of Italy data showing how women have been uh, uh, hit more severely than men uh, in terms of their income and their fragility. And uh, I would like to cite uh, to mention one category that has not, not been cited, which is uh, uh, micro entrepreneurs, self em self employed and micro entrepreneurs. Um, they have been hit severely, um, depending a lot on the on the, uh, for example, on the sector, on the level of digitalization. Um, we do have evidence actually that uh, the way that they have been hit depends also on their level of financial literacy of the owner. Uh, where the owner had a higher level of literacy, uh, the, the firm, the micro firm, has been able to face uh, um, in a better way uh, the pandemic in terms of uh, being able to, to have liquidity buffers built from below, but also to use, uh, to better use uh, uh, financing instrument provided by the government, for example. Well, I think this shows somehow that uh, uh, we need to work with different instruments. Um, probably as a reaction to the crisis, we need certainly very horizontal instruments that somehow reach everybody. And what I always say is that we need both protection instruments, financial consumer protection instruments, and we did a lot during the pandemic, and financial education instrument. Some instruments that it really reach everybody. And then we have to work for specific 
vulnerable groups. And for those, we really need to have information, data, as Anna was suggesting and has been said before, uh, to understand exactly how to reach them, how to address their specific vulnerabilities, and how to be permanent in the impact uh, that we are able to produce. Thank you. Thank you, Bagda. It's, um, so the right tool for the right uh, target uh, group, uh, I, I see it. And maybe let's start with some of those group um, in terms of what concretely we could do. Uh, Anne-Sophie, on from, from oh. your... Uh, yeah, I'll yeah, hit the Q click and bring it um, Yes, please, if someone can mute the microphone. So, Anne Sophie, from, from your perspective, um, um, what do you think we can do to address uh, the concern of financial education for your group, the, the senior one? Let, let, uh, let me call it like that. Just to start with the specific uh, tool. Yes. Um, uh, you, please. There are more general uh, concerns that uh, existed, I would say, before the very recent events, the COVID crisis and, uh, and everything that has come with it. Um, so more generally, uh, we notice that uh, all the persons, but that concerns the 50 pluses already, are absolutely not properly prepared for retirement. What does that mean? What kind of impact this will have? whether or not uh, all the, the financial services they have will still be fit for purpose and this kind of information. It's again even more so a problem with uh, female workers who are retiring. Um, most of the time, uh, if you're lucky, you get a little extra pot of money um, to, yeah, that you have been saving through uh, occupational pensions or private pensions. You're left on your own to decide what to do with it, but you just don't know what kind of risk you have to cover. So much more must be explained. Because here, I think it's not only all the persons who uh, suffer from what is called comparative optimism. It's all of us. We always tend to underestimate the risk compared to the uh, similar profiles of risk that we are. We can be very well aware that uh, we have so much percentage of getting such illness of having this kind of problem. Uh, but we tend to always think it will be for the others, not for us. And uh, if you relating that to uh, women again, since on general, we earn much less than men for comparable works. Um, and uh, we have even much lower pensions as a result of that. Sometimes there are choices we just cannot make, even if we know that the risk is there, we just cannot afford to cover ourselves properly. So we need better services, better fitted for the different profiles and risks to be covered. And then come the additional very recent risk that nobody predicted. What happens with COVID uh, survivors or the widows in particular, widows as well, but widows are in a much worse uh, position for the moment. Nothing was, nobody was ready for that. And uh, they are left on their own again to uh, try and uh, and survive and, fi and find the, the correct decision to be made for their financial future. But nobody expected also the climate change disasters, natural disasters, and all the persons are particularly vulnerable because they don't have many years to live to reconstruct their lives. They have lost all their savings there. And then what about inflation? Now, this is in every newspapers, every TV news. Inflation with its, its impact on the cost of energy. Some people are going to pay more for the energy bill than for uh, um, paying the, the rent or uh, paying for their mortgage. How can we make sure people understand that such tricks can happen, but also how can we help them? Because obviously it's not for them to find a solution on their own. They are, nobody's going to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Sophie. In the meantime, I see some questions from the panelists. I, I encourage uh, also using the chat to, to those who want to, as Anna Maria is doing. Maybe one uh, one point now for the for the insurance uh, sector. You quoted uh, already your study in your first uh, intervention, Michaela. Can um, can you talk a bit uh, more about uh, what what the, the the research you have done as insurance europe on the 
on how people are saving for their pension. Uh, I know that you interviewed uh, 16,000 people in 16 countries. What, what were the findings uh, of the survey? How this can help uh, our discussion today, please? Yeah, thank you very much, Fausto. Um, indeed, this is our second pension survey, and our ambition is, you know, over time to build also time series to show developments. But let's first look uh, directly at the results of our uh, second survey. And you asked, you know, how do citizens prepare fi financially for retirement? And I think the first uh, point that I would like to make is that the survey results unfortunately show that many people do not save at all, you know, in addition uh, to the state pension um, on the private side or through workplace pension. Uh, this number is really high. Uh, we are talking about 38% of respondents to the survey. And now if we uh, dive a little bit deeper and look at vulnerable groups, um, then you see also the same picture developing that Anna Maria um, and Anne Sophie have already described. We have here also a pension uh, gender gap. Uh, so 42% of female respondents um, have responded that they are not saving at all compared to 34 male uh, respondents. Uh, we have also more single people who are vulnerable than married people. We have uh, people with lower income um, having, uh, you know, um, higher non-saving rates than uh, people with um, medium or higher, um, uh, um, sorry, not income, education. Uh, and then, of course, unemployed people also have uh, a problem of saving. But what we found was even more concerning is that of those that are not saving at all, 33%, so really um, a fairly large group, has uh, said that they are not interested in saving for retirement. So not only do they not save, but they are not interested in saving. And um, while there are maybe a few uh, that don't have to save because they have maybe enough um, through, I don't know, um, uh, you know, through the family, I would assume, we would assume that a majority of people are in fact really, uh, you know, facing financial difficulties then in retirement. And there is uh, therefore a very clear need uh, to raise awareness. Now, um, I think um, Anna Maria has raised also the problem um, in her presentation uh, that there is also um, a payout dilemma, you know, longevity versus liquidity. Uh, these are issues that we have also looked at in our survey. Uh, for example, when you ask um, people, uh, what, how do you want to use your benefit once you are retiring um, and you give them choices, a majority of respondents uh, uh, said that they would prefer annuities. So 43% said annuities is clearly their preferred payout choice. But the moment you give them monetary estimates and you say, you know, would you prefer 50,000 euros uh, payout or 2,500 euros annually, the picture changes. Um, and, and that, of course, it's also interesting. And that has to do with financial education because um, I think it's complex to analyze, but there is um, a bias towards larger sum. And there is probably also bias towards, you know, um, essentially addressing short term needs. And uh, as Anne Sophie said, also sometimes unrealistic expectations, um, uh, over optimistic expectations. So uh, clearly, there is um, an increased and uh, a clear need to um, really um, reinforce our efforts to uh, have financial education. But at the same time, I think we should also be realistic and understand that financial literacy is one piece, one important piece, but just one piece of the puzzle, especially when it comes to pension. Other things like financial incentives, you know, or auto enrollment for the workplace pension, tax benefits play a role. And I think we should also not underestimate that the way we inform people about our products is making, can make a difference. If you drown people in information, if you give them a lot of legalese instead of clear language, if you make it difficult for them to address and find information, these are all things that uh, we need to look at.
Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Michela. It's um, also in indirect um, support to one of the questions from the audience. I see that uh, there are questions on the role of the product disclosure or financial advice that Anna Maria is, Anna Maria is also answering. Can I can I just check, uh, Anne Sophie, for example? Do you share the view that the the product uh, disclosure is important? But as uh, Anna Maria is uh, is answering in the chat, uh, the the people in general do not pay so much attention. So it's it's important, but do not rely so much on that as a representative of one of our groups. Let's say, if I may, sorry. Yes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I, I speak on behalf of all consumers, of course, but uh, no. more uh, from the perspective of older persons and older women in particular. Um, the, the financial advice or the financial information, rather, that is uh, provided is useful when you want to compare. Uh, some people are, are quite good at comparing different options, and uh, this is helped by the fact that we do have more comparable data between different uh, types of products. Uh, but most people would prefer to trust someone they feel would give them the best uh, um, uh, advice. And this is where it becomes difficult for consumers organizations. This is really a big role, and it uh, would mean that they would really present it from a, a totally independent perspective, it becomes more difficult for, uh, for many consumers to trust advice that comes from one provider uh, rather than a, a neutral uh, party, we would say. So that's where financial uh, education is something that comes from a neutral source when financial advice can or cannot be coming from a totally independent uh, source. And uh, this is something that uh, can be complemented by uh, by NGOs, for example. Um, seniors organization have uh, do quite a lot of work trying to raise awareness and encourage uh, older people to think in a more um, uh, active way about their uh, their financial needs. And they tend to present the different options in in an independent way because they don't have any direct links or interest in the products that they uh, they present. Thanks a lot. And we have heard um, Madame, um, Madame um, Jean Courten, the, the vice chair of Econ Committee, mentioning the financial coaching, the conflict of interest issue, and uh, um, reactivate a bit the contract between the people in terms of uh, pe people and provider in terms of conflicts. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Peter, to you now. Can you can you mention some of the the example what the banks can do in practical terms to to address the issue of financial education and financial resilience for vulnerable group? How we can connect this discussion between people and banking system? What's your view? Uh, yes, of course uh, I can. But uh, first of all, uh, allow me um, uh, to answer to Mati Lepola from Pension Europe. If you see what he wrote here, he corrected one of my first statements. And I have to admit, he's 100 percent right with his comment. He writes, not everybody needs his haircut. Yeah, so this is true, uh, but most of us, at least, yeah, <laughs> our moderator, also perhaps not as much, but the rest of all the people on the panel for sure. So, but coming back to your questions, um, the WSBI members um, held their first World Congress nearly 100 years before on 31st of October 1924, uh, combined with the first ever World Savings Day. And uh, as you might know, every year we celebrate financial education initiatives during our World Savings Day with members around the world dedicating their time to financial literacy programs and courses to the regions in which they serve. But financial education, as we all know, is not just for one day per year. We continuously strive to provide neutral information to all. And this is, by the way, um, uh, answering also perhaps to the uh, contribution before. In Germany, a legal mandate given to the German Saving Bank Association, as they serve by law the public interest, to provide free, neutral financial education materials to all German citizens. So, it is something not only for clients, and this is not concrete advice, this is 
financial literacy information um, that they give via a legal mandate. And their courses have been in place since 1957 in inform uh, on even the latest development on uh, crypto nowadays, digitalization, sustainability um, issues. Um, the financial education service works there with NGOs um, who work with vulnerable groups uh, to that would be difficult to reach otherwise. So single parents um, over indebted citizens or low income workers. But we have examples like this all around the world, for example, in Uganda, um, where they have a platform for young girls in a project called a Women for a Campaign to learn the, the financial foundations uh, and, and start uh, savings. Um, or from the Dominican Republic, where they focus on um, handicapped. Yeah, they have developed the APAP TODOS program on financial inclusion and financial education, um, starting uh, with hearing impaired initially. So the institution has trained um, uh, stuff in each of its branches in sign language, for example, just small um, examples from uh, all over the world. Um, one uh, example that I like most, uh, I have to be honest, uh, between um, lots of um, not so normal uh, financial education um, measures within our membership is um, uh, the example of the Albarit Bank from Morocco. They have created a TV program yeah, uh, about budgetary and financial education that uh, was available to all Moroccan citizens, but targeted low-income families. The, pro the project was uh, presented as a weekly TV show called uh, Dear La Bas and broadcasted on the national channel for 26 weeks. Um, they also um, installed a fun web series called Bakwadiru La Bas. The, the goal of both programs was to make finance a common topic uh, by popularizing the banking system and uh, savings and offering guidance to young people, households and project leaders and how to better manage day-to-day -day finances and use their money. When the TV program ended a couple of years ago, um, it had reached an average audience of more than 1.2 million during the 28 episodes and uh, nearly the same um, uh, number of viewers uh, uh, within the, um, uh, that uh, watched the, the web series. Take Austria to come back uh, uh, to Europe. Um, here we have a financial education program, uh, especially for uh, the youngs. Um, uh, since many, many years, very successful, um, looking at the youngest um, uh, of uh, 15 to 19 years old, um, uh, uh, provided by Jugend am Werk. Um, they offer professional training for young people who have a low level of education and have not found an um, uh, apprenticeship on the market. Um, examples um, like this um, we have in Norway, we have in France, also since nearly 70 uh, years in, in France, with a, a finance, finance, a pedagogy uh, uh, program. Uh, all have one in common. They know that there is not one single vulnerable group, but they try to find specialized answers for specialized, special vulnerable groups. These were just um, some examples, uh, but uh, as I tell, told you, uh, savings banks have um, financial literacy um, as um, a part of their long standing uh, tradition um, included. Um, uh, it is for us natural, uh, beside business advice, to make this completely clear, to offer to everybody, but especially to vulnerable uh, groups, channel information that makes people more financial literate. So a list, a, a list of uh, good examples on uh, concrete action that we can do. Maybe one other is uh, from the Italian experience, Magda. I know that you mentioned already something, but do you want to uh, add something on the initiative, especially in the yeah, maybe, time? 
Right. Um, maybe I can detail a little bit what I was saying before. Um, separating the, the, say, the horizontal approach, the general approach, uh, which was necessary um, immediately uh, during and immediately after the, the head of the pandemic uh, to react uh, to, to what was needed by many, many groups of people um, from the specific uh, um, approach for, for single groups. Um, through the, the, the horizontal approach was performed both uh, through the Financial Education Committee um, headed by Anna Maria and through the national portal um, and also by each member uh, belonging to the national uh, committee, for example, uh, the Bank of Italy, but also others. Uh, we developed uh, basically awareness campaigns both on the government measures to support households, employees, firms, but also interactive tools, um, for example, um, to, to help families uh, to avoid over indebtedness or to help them calculate uh, uh, mortgage suspension, to compare uh, renegotiation measures and so on. In a sense, uh, taking advantage of the momentum of the need of consumers to find uh, very reliable, very serious information on what could help them to provide them some forms of financial education. Um, a second horizontal measure was awareness campaigns on uh, um, on uh, safety, on the safe use of electronic payments. Uh, we know that digitalization um, was enhanced hugely during the pandemic, and this increased also risks. So campaigns on how to avoid uh, somehow scams and frauds on the on the net was another horizontal campaign. And Anna Maria also mentioned in the chat uh, um, a, a sort of web series that, that we developed uh, with DG Reform, uh, which is very nice and very friendly. It's a sort of, as she was saying, a Netflix series uh, um, to help people understand the basics of financial education in a friendly, in a friendly way. And these are somehow horizontal measures. Then, of course, uh, um, we, uh, we try to address specific vulnerable groups. And there, as I said, we need to be very careful careful of what is needed uh, on the method to reach them. Women, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we launched uh, an online section of our, of the Bank of Italy financial education portal with video lessons, quiz, uh, multimedia material, focusing on topics that were very relevant during the crisis, but also keeping into account to address the specificities of this group. We know that women are somehow underconfident, especially when uh, you speak about financial literacy, and hence we have to approach the topic in a specific way. And on the other hand, uh, we need not only to use uh, digital instruments, but also to reach them directly. And hence here we need uh, alliances with groups uh, that work all over the country. We, uh, Bank of Italy, have branches all over Italy in all region capitals, but we allied with other groups uh, who work specifically with women, with fragile women, to reach them more directly. Um, the second group I was talking about are artisans and micro entrepreneurs. Um, there we are developing uh, a course aimed to teach the basics of investments of banking products uh, and insurance, those necessary to, to run a small business. Um, the project started at the end of 2021 uh, together with the entrepreneurial associations. And again, the idea is to reach both digitally, but also in person with the help of allies, in this case, entrepreneurial associations of artisans and micro firms, um, the final user at, at, their, at their base. Um, another group, migrants. Um, the migrant population in Italy is characterized by low level of financial education. Uh, there is a widespread use of mobile devices, but uh, uh, only few of them use them for financial operations. Again, we've developed uh, um, financial education programs uh, for public schools for adults, uh, which are mainly attended actually by migrants or people with low income. And again, uh, the, we are focusing in this case on payments 
and specifically remittances, for example, for migrants, uh, but also planning. And, and again, in response of the pandemic, we are developing course material, which is specific for them, apps uh, and tests uh, to facilitate financial awareness. Uh, the last group, which is very important, and it's not a group, it's huge, it's students. Um, as we learned before, as Anna showed us, um, they are becoming a vulnerable group. During the pandemic, they have been hugely affected in a very dishomogeneous way. Um, from our side, we, we try to transfer online all our programs. We do uh, programs with school uh, since 2009 with the Bank of Italy. We reach every year approximately 100,000 students, uh, which is a lot for us, but nothing for the school until we manage, as Anna always says, to make uh, some elements of financial literacy compulsory in school, we will fight to reach them. Uh, but again, during the pandemic, we developed uh, uh, material which could be used online, adapted because we couldn't use the same material as was used in presence, uh, and, and also a number of instruments which have become uh, more, uh, more interactive uh, to, to engage them uh, in a stronger way, like prizes and so on. So for each group, specific tools, specific methodologies, and now hopefully, for example, for schools, we are developing um, evaluation, evaluation of effectiveness of our programs, which is uh, a general weakness of all financial education programs. We don't have too much testing, so we are trying to develop that. And if I may add about the question on the role of transparency uh, as an instrument to help uh, uh, consumers, uh, I have to do it because as a, as a supervisor, we rely a lot on that. Uh, and I guess I share that with Fausto. Um, we know that transparency is, um, is an instrument effective up to a point. Uh, um, we know that as regulators and supervisors, uh, but also the, the regulators, those who are writing laws, are moving from transparency only to fairness. And actually, I have to mention that the three ESAs uh, over the last few years developed uh, uh, product oversight and governance guidelines, uh, which are really moving supervision from just uh, supervision on transparency, which helps somehow, but if consumers are not really well equipped, uh, probably helps up to a point, to imposing producers uh, to think about uh, the real needs of consumers when they design products. Uh, so I think this is the future. We as supervisor are working a lot in this direction, really um, working at the beginning when, when, cons when producers start designing their products, making sure that they are really designed according to needs of final consumers. Thanks. Well, so do you allow me just to respond uh, one second? Because as we learn now, so many interesting one things about second, each yes. One second, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, as we learn now, so many interesting things about uh, Italy. Uh, just to inform you, by law, the Italian um, savings banks foundations yeah, um, spend their money uh, to especially vulnerable uh, groups, one billion per year for measures uh, of financial uh, literacy, um, uh, um, and especially uh, focused on uh, young people not in employment or in uh, education, low-income families and disabled and elderly. So this is an obligation um, uh, by law. And uh, allow me a second short comment. If you see, look here in the comments, that's all uh, coming again and again. Uh, the, the question that was originally raised by one of the panel speakers before, uh, the differentiation between advice for products and uh, uh, education of financial literacy. What the saving banks does here in schools of a pupil has absolutely nothing to do with concrete products. And uh, we have here Mr. List with us, yeah, the director of FLIP, the Financial Life Park. If you once have seen this incredible, impressing uh, park, which uh, hosted more than 100,000 um, pupils uh, in uh, the last uh, year and uh, gives them financial education, I was last uh, year, then you know it's only about 
channel knowledge and not about products because this is the self-understanding has nothing to do with somebody comes in a branch and wants an advice for sure we advise about products but this is something completely different if it's done in germany if it's done in austria if it's done in spain where lots of initiative of our Spanish members, Kaisha Bank, with local uh, actors uh, together are financed that only inform about uh, financial literacy without any business um, uh, relation. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Maybe let's, um, I also took some other notes coming from uh, the, the chat, but maybe now I want to make a, a a round of question on the, the digital issue, the digital impact, uh, how this can help and how, what are the risks that, that this, uh, you already mentioned something that during the pandemic, it's accelerated a lot the, the digitalization all over our life, let's say. Uh, let's see if this can be part of uh, the improvement or which are the risks. Maybe I, I will start with um, Michaela from, uh, from your side, advanced data technology how this can uh, maybe help financial inclusion in the long run and what are the risks in your view? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm uh, fully convinced that uh, it can help. Um, I also noted in the chat that um, I think it was Anna Maria who said people do not generally pay attention to disclosures and um, I think it has probably a multitude of elements that we have to consider. But um, when you look at it, I think digital can give us new tools um, that could allow us um, to bring really the consumer in a more um, intu intuitive way uh, to look for the information that is really relevant for them. Uh, right now, what we do, we drown consumers in loads of paper and um, essentially uh, the feedback at least we get often and frequently is that they don't see the wood for the trees. If you de develop digital pathways, there is of course a much better way when you um, layer information, when you work with pop-ups, um, that uh, you know you can uh, guide the consumer to what he or she is really interested in. Now, also coming back to our pension survey again, uh, it was quite interesting. We also asked um, with um, the participants, you know, what would they prefer, paper-based approach or a digital approach? And 72% of respondents expressed the preference to receive their information digitally rather than on paper. I also believe it is important that um, we look at what we uh, um, provide information on. Um, for example, right now, when you look at the European framework, uh, what you can clearly note is there is this load of information, but also there are lots of um, elements that relate to costs. And, and while uh, these cost uh, elements are certainly important, what is missing is often other elements, especially when it comes to uh, insurance. Um, what we have learned from the pandemic that there is a really a clear need to explain cover and exclusion. And I think that is also something that you have recently raised in the Consumer Trends Report. But then when you look at our regulatory framework, what we see is that there is simply no space, um, literally, you know, space uh, left to explain cover and exclusion. And for me, what was very interesting in our survey, um, we asked people, you know, when you are looking for information about your retirement and how you want, what are you looking for when you say for retirement and we gave them options of what would be their top priorities and then you have for example 10 percent saying uh, my top priority is sustainable investment you have 14 um, percent saying my top priority is investment performance you know how good is the product how much profit uh, will i make we have um uh, twenty three percent saying uh, my uh, my top priority is tax relief. But you know what topped the list and what was the absolute outlier 
Number one was, I want to know about security. So security in insurance terms, of course, also equals to an extent cover. You know, am I safe when I invest? Um, either safe on, you know, the financial guarantees or the biometric risk. And there is literally no space to provide information. So um, to put it even one step further, we have also asked, do you prefer uh, performance um, or security when you are uh, safe? And also there, I thought it was very interesting. We have 83% uh, of respondents saying they prefer security. So again, we are back to the cover, you know, and uh, to Anne Sophie's point earlier, when you ask women, it's 88%, so even higher. And these elements, they are not really pointed out in our current regulatory framework, and definitely we need to do more about that. And last point, um, maybe also a reflection for the supervisors and regulators when it comes to insurance. And since we are also currently in a reform of our, our uh, prudential framework, our prudential framework in the last years had, has pushed more and more risk on the individual, risk that can be taken by the industry when it comes to providing guarantees. So this could also maybe be a reflection point. It's a very broad picture that I'm now painting, but I think we need to look at it also in a holistic way if we want to address the problem. Thank you very much. No, thanks a lot. And of course, uh, you will not be surprised uh, if I say that it was not the prudential framework that the uh, put the risk more on the shareholders. But on this, we, we might have different uh, views, of course. Um, Peter, from your side, uh, what we can do to, to, be, to let people be more aware of uh, how and when to share data, how we can use the data for their benefits? I think also here it's important to look at uh, the different target groups and also here um, uh, we have to be clear that, that there is not one target of vulnerable uh, people but that it's a, a moving target and uh, we have to give answers uh, uh, to their special, uh, special situation. So for example, uh, take the, the very youngs, you have uh, to make them clear what happens with the data in their all day use um, in the internet. These uh, um, the digital natives often have no idea that there is nothing for free in life and especially not in the internet and that if they pay nothing that they pay with their data. And uh, to, to raise awareness here more and more um, uh, is as important as, now look to the other side, uh, perhaps help um, uh, um, elderly people who um, are not so experienced in protecting themselves uh, from uh, scams uh, and uh, um, from abuse of uh, um, uh, their um, uh, daily uh, digital use. Um, um, that to help them being aware what they can do technically um, uh, to um, protect themselves uh, better um, here. Boosting digital skills um, um, is of great importance. Not um, only is there a link between the digital skills and financial literacy, but also the sharing of data takes place to a large extent in digital uh, environments. So we all um, have uh, to bring into our programs of financial uh, literacy and financial education uh, a chapter focused for each target group um, uh, about uh, data protection. Thank you. The view from uh, the senior, uh, Anne Sophie, and then Magda, maybe you can quote the work uh, in the G20 context uh, on, the, on this. Please, Anne Sophie. Yes, uh, very briefly. Um, of course, we all know that older persons are less uh, di digitally uh, skilled than the, the, the rest of the population. Although in France, a recent study that was uh, published uh, just a few weeks ago shows that actually 20% of the 15, 29 do not feel confident enough, although they use a smartphone every day for social medias, for connecting with their friends, they do not feel confident enough 
to uh, use the, their smartphones, for example, to make payments. This is a large group of young people who are supposed to have all the digital skills they need to function today. Um, I wouldn't really uh, agree too much by uh, when I hear that older persons do not know how to protect their data. The problem is that some of them do not want to use digital means, financial means, but they are forced to do it. And that's where it hurts when you are being told then that you are too old and you don't know how to protect your data. It's your fault if you fall victim of fraud of scans. This is a this wrong message to send to the older, older uh, population. They are more than happy to learn how to do it properly. But those are things that we have to change the rules, the ways, the, the techniques to protect yourself. It's almost on a daily basis. You have to, to learn new tricks because the scammers are always ahead of you. And believe me, the hackers even manage to get around the protection of the most uh, digitally uh, and educated people. So we have to take this issue of increased risk that comes with digital means very seriously and make sure that we design products and financial education programs that are really targeting the specific profile so that we avoid leaving uh, out a large number of the population. Because Michaela, 72% of the people responded they wanted to have information digitally. That leaves 28% who wouldn't like it. And that's a large group, too large to, to just ignore. Thank you. Um, Fausto, if I can react directly, yes, Sorry. and I fully agree with you. And this is why, you know, we need um, to offer obviously both pathways but right now we have the reverse you know we are catering essentially for the majority that we push into a pathway that they don't like and uh, i'm not saying we should abolish the opportunity to provide written feedback and um, uh, also provide written explanation and i fully see your point but i think we need to think um, the distribution system differently and we need to identify also ways for the elderly population uh, to make uh, digital uses uh, user friendly and there are, there is there are also studies out there that can um, be, as i described it in uh, by way of introduction then can that can um, really guide um, the users in a very intuitive manner and in a very safe manner so um, again Michaela, it has to do with financial let me, education <laughs> let me stop because i know uh, the vice chair of the econ committee already mentioned some uh, work to improve uh, the retail the investment retail strategy the DD, the PRIPS, the regulator. So there is an attention from the regulatory side to improve things. So I, I do hope that this will happen soon. Uh, Magda, maybe quickly the point uh, if you are still um, connected, I see some. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, yes. Um, um, one go, word, please. maybe on, yeah, on, on the, the word. The, um, uh, I, uh, Magda, can you switch off the video? Uh, Try to check if we can hear better because I. Okay. Is it better like that? Try again because we were missing you a bit. Can you hear? Can you hear me now? No, no, you can hear me. No, I don't know what happened. We were fine till the, the last moment. Maybe we, let me take the chance to try to see if there is any question from the from the audience. Maybe because I see a lot of um, people are very actively mentioning things and uh, and the example and sharing views. Uh, and thanks a lot, Anna Maria, to really answer on time to all the questions you received. But in case there is any question, we still have uh, some minutes. Please uh, put it for the in the chat. I don't see anyone coming now. In the meantime, uh, I also ask uh, the staff to maybe put uh, a, a question for all the audience to answer. The question number two we were planning to have. We are late. We cannot have all the questions. But at least the number two, I would like to to check 
with our audience. I can read the question while you are um, you are putting this uh, in the in the chat. The question for the audience it, it will help us, of course, if you answer. It's uh, how do you think that the ESAs can yes, echo best contribute to addressing the issue of financial education and financial resilience of vulnerable group going forward? You may select one answer. I hope that everybody see the the, the question in the chat. You have some time. Uh, the answer is uh, to be chosen between developed best practices for national financial education initiative targeting vulnerable groups, enhance external stakeholder engagement to discuss lessons learned, or promote non-commercial initiatives and such as gamification by national authorities. We have heard a lot of uh, example. Uh, Peter mentioned also example from around the world. What is the, the suggestion for the three ESAs to, to take uh, away today on this item? How we can do our best effort to help? Let's see, time elapsed, fully descended. How we can see the, the outcome? Wow, no answer was the, maybe it was too quick. <laughs> maybe next time we need to have uh, more than one minute. Okay, but then I, I revert to all of you the question actually. What, you, what is your suggestion for us, the three as as to what we concretely may need to do from now on? Peter, starting by you this time. Oh, the ESAS can uh, do quite a bit to support vulnerable groups in an indirect way, allowing responsible banks to carry out their daily activities, such as lending to the real economy and uh, providing SME loans, which boost jobs and growth in local areas. We have had 10 years of heavy changes to regulations, and whilst I admit that uh, a lot of this has been necessary and the financial sector is stronger because of it, banks now need time to implement it all and focus more on their business rather than how to implement the next wave of regulation. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has shown that banks are stronger than before. And we have not been a part of the problem over the past two years, but actually part of the solution. We have been able to support consumers through the pandemic by providing a moratoria on loans, yes. which, as you know, uh, the ASAs had a big shorter, role. In our shorter bank suggestion, Peter. Shorter suggestion, because we are running out of time. <laughs> Michaela, your suggestion <laughs> shorter. shorter. But... Okay, well, first, yes, the ASAs have a role, and I think they could do all of the above. Okay, and Sophie. Same as Michaela, I think all of the above are needed. That means ensuring that consumer protection works as well for the most vulnerable ones, and then involving the NGOs and consumers groups in designing future measures and communicating about them. Good. I don't know if Magda can still uh, answer. Otherwise, uh, if I may, Dear Professor, maybe your last uh, suggestion for the three ESAs, you already mentioned, of course, something we, it's inspiring us, but any last word before we move to the next session? If well, I thank may. Thank you very much uh, for this. I, I really, Magda, go ahead. I don't know if Magda, you can, uh, can you try again? No, I don't, I don't want to interrupt Ana Maria, go ahead. <laughs> no, Amanda, you weren't able to speak, so um, uh, just, uh, you know, if you're able to connect, please. I don't know whether you hear me now. Try, so... please. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, no, just just a reply no. on the last uh, on the last issue. Um, what uh, what could we do? Um, what could we as national authorities and ASAS do? I think we could uh, try to work on synergies across consumer protection and financial literacy. I think there are a lot and we should uh, share them. And then I think sharing best practices across uh, uh, different authorities uh, would be really useful. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Magda. And now you, Ana Maria, please. 
I just want to echo what uh, many um, many speakers uh, at the panel, at this excellent panel, have mentioned, which is that uh, if we improve financial literacy for all, for all, and in particular for the vulnerable groups, we all benefit. So this is not doing good. Uh, this is an investment that is going to benefit regulators, is going to uh, benefit banks, is going to benefit the uh, pensions and, and insurance uh, companies as well, uh, because uh, having informed consumer who can make good financial decisions allows them to buy more complex financial instruments uh, and benefits the market. So it is an investment for the future. And I always say the crisis gives us an opportunity to reimagine the future. We cannot go back to the normal before the pandemic because it was not good enough. I know a third of the population in Europe would not have been able to face a small shock, let alone a, a, a big one. So I hope we can use the crisis and the funds offered by Europe as an opportunity to invest, invest in particularly in the vulnerable group. And I really want to mention the young. Um, we need to invest in them because they are our future. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna Maria. And I also see so in the chat someone asking for developing the same index you were quoting for the EU. So maybe one day we can call you to, to support in this additional work. But thanks a lot. Um, it, I just want to really thank uh, all the panelists. Interesting um, views, sharing practices, uh, mentioning uh, what we have done, what others have done, lessons learned from um, all the side of the of the world and the all the players so really thanks a lot now is for us a bit a challenge to sum up and to try to understand what is next step maybe uh, as uh, Michaela and Magda are, were mentioning we need to work a bit on uh, how what we can do next maybe starting focusing which is the target group we want to address first and I hear uh, yeah, I have some ideas because some of you already mentioned women as a part of uh, the, the first priority, let's say. But thanks again. Um, I also want to thank um, all the audience for actively contributing also during the, the, the panel, which was for me a bit a challenge to follow everything. But I hope that uh, the answers were given also via the chat. And uh, I can say now that we have a bit of coffee break. We will restart at four o'clock, so you may have uh, just a, a minute to relax and then another important topic. So a quarter of hour. Thanks a lot. See you soon at four o'clock. Bye bye, Fausto. Bye bye, everyone. It was a real pleasure. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
Bonjour, Jacob. Hi, bonjour, Thierry. Tu vas bien? Oui, ça va, merci. Et toi? Félicitations ça... à ton nouveau kit. Euh, ça va très bien, ça va très bien. Ça fait plaisir d'interagir avec toi. Oui, ça fait, ça fait longtemps. Eh oui. I think it's time to restart. It's okay. four o'clock, right? Then I will um, I will simply <clears throat> introduce the moderator of the next panel, Jakob Thomas, managing director of Two Degrees Investing Initiative. The following session uh, will um, deal with financial education and sustainable finance. So, another important topic. Please, uh, Jacob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. What a pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon. Uh, last but not least, I believe here on the topic of sustainable finance. My name is Jacob Tome. As introduced, I'm executive director at Two Degrees Investing Initiative Germany. We're a nonprofit think tank focused exclusively on sustainable finance. So, this is a, a great conversation for us to have and join today. Uh, I'm looking forward to moderating this panel today uh, on sustainable finance at the forefront of both policy and market discussions. Um, I think it's become clear to both financial institutions and policymakers that sustainability is an plays an important role, not just for the real economy, but also for financial markets. Um, and obviously, there are two sides to this, the sustainability risk component and the question of supporting the transition to a low carbon economy. It's obviously great to see as well that the European Banking Authority and IOPA and the ESMA are being particularly active in this area. And I, I think we're really looking forward to talking a little bit about some of the initiatives in this space. Uh, but I think it's also clear that as we introduce sustainable finance to the discourse, we are also confronted with questions around financial literacy and sustainable financial literacy, which is not always the same and potentially requires new learning and educational needs for individuals. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, it's clear that literacy has been an issue underexplored over the last couple of years. So great to see it get the attention here today. Uh, but before we do that with four absolutely fantastic panelists, we're going to have a presentation on sustainable finance and disclosures um, by Professor Alexander Kahn. He's the Chair for Law and sorry, Ken Alexander is the Chair for Law and Finance at the University of Zurich. 
and he's going to be opening the session today with his presentation. So uh, the floor is yours to talk about sustainable finance and disclosures. And then, of course, afterwards, I'll introduce our excellent panel. All right. Can you hear us? Is there, there seems to be an audio video problem. But yes, we, we can hear you fine. Okay, but we don't seem to hear the colleague from Zurich. I don't know if there's, he can hear us. Yes, Matthias from BBS speaking. Um, Mr. Alexander, maybe please just look off and then lock on again. Slides, Jakob. Ah, voila. Can you? Ah, now it seems to work. Now it seems to work. Okay. Let's try. Let's give it a go. Let's see if okay, we can. Great, excellent. Okay, good. Well, thanks very much. Um, I, I my talk today is really to kind of kick off this. Uh, there's a panel discussion uh, on uh, on sustainable finance and regulation and some of uh, individual bank oh we've lost our our introductory speaker perhaps yeah perhaps perhaps we'll try it with without the camera can and then we'll and then it might be a little bit okay. better. Can, can, you see, can you see me now? Yeah, we can see and hear you now. Have you switched um, wi Wi-Fi? Is that working better for you? Maybe the Wi-Fi team can put, put the slides up. There we are. Great. So I, I want it. Can you please go into slideshow mode? Um, all right, we are having some apologies to the participants. We are having our predictable technology issues. Um, perhaps can you try? Is there an alternative Wi Fi, an alternative uh, dial-in option for you? Uh, if you can hear me, can for the for the introductory presentation, it would be an absolute shame if that didn't work. We'll just give it another two, two or three minutes to try and set all that up properly so that we can make sure we can benefit from the insights. Um, it would be a shame to have to start without it. Can you hear us, Ken? Are we still fighting with the audio? If, if we still have problems in another minute, what I might do is I might get into the panel so that we're not sitting here silent with happiness, looking at each other while we're trying to get the Wi-Fi to work. And then we might have to have the presentation towards the end. I know that's an unorthodox way to do it and not ideal. Um, and then we, we have the uh, presentation at the end, however. Okay, I think we, we might have to do that so we don't waste uh, too much time and that we um, can benefit from the insights. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to hopefully get the colleague from Zurich set up properly with Wi-Fi and everything, and then uh, we'll have the presentation at the end of today's panel so we can so we can move ahead um, with the topic. So I think be you know we can move into the panel and I won't try and replicate all the insights that we could have had from uh, Ken Alexander, but I do think it might be worthwhile just to give a little bit of agenda or scene setting before we get into the Q and A. So I, for those of you who um, fell asleep five years ago or six years ago and woke up today at this panel, uh, you'd be surprised to see the world that we live in when it comes to sustainable finance. Um, I remember having many conversations with Thierry in particular at the time about where we need to go. And I'm in particular keen to hear from, from him, but obviously also from everybody about the progress that we've made. But it is really been an absolute roller coaster ride. 
Um, and I mean that in the best of terms about the attention and focus on sustainable finance that we see. Uh, just to mention a few, we have obviously in 2021 last year, the delivery of the regulatory technical standards on the sustainable finance disclosure regulation, the taxonomy regulation, uh, which have, uh, are now active. We have the delegated acts in the markets and financial instruments directive and the insurance distribution directive which focus on the integration of sustainability factors and ESG considerations and product governance framework. And obviously investment advice plays an important role here as well. Um, Esma and Ayopa are currently reviewing and preparing guidelines to take into consideration the new provisions under MIFI II and the institution, sorry, the institu insurance distribution directive respectively. And then we also have the work on the eco label to retail financial products. So eco labels already exist in many different par parts for European products and that extension to financial products is underway. It's designed to help consumers obviously identify financial products and make environmentally sustainable investments. But it's not just policy that's been active and we have some very interesting initiatives we'll hear about in the panel today. Uh, we have uh, numerous programs around building sustainable finance literacy. We have a lot of research around consumer demand, retail investor demand and what their needs are and what their capabilities are and capacities. We have non-commercial platforms. I'm involved in one of them, full disclosure, called MyFairMoney.com, which is designed just to help educate retail investors around sustainability, and which is uh, operating in Germany and France and the UK and, and ex uh, expanding to other markets. And we obviously have a number of commercial offerings as well, especially in the area of robo-advice, where sustainability is becoming front and center. But, and here's the but, which we'll talk about, we also have strong evidence from that research that there is significant need to familiarize and educate consumers on issues of sustainability and ESG investing uh, on the taxonomy and all the other components of the EU uh, sustainable finance action plan and what is coming down the pipeline now in order to allow them to fully benefit from these uh, advancements on the policy side. Um, and uh, it might not be the same journey that we have with financial literacy more broadly, but it can be equally important as consumers struggle to understand what the difference is between buying free range eggs in a supermarket and trying to buy a sustainable fund and all the complexities and nuances that come with that. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists who are going to educate us about this topic. We have four fantastic panelists. Um, Pascale Munafo is a senior officer at General Manager's Office Consob and chair of the IOSCO. C8 on retail investors and co-chair of the OSCO C8 Working Group on Sustainable Finance and Investor Education. Welcome, Pascale. We have uh, Thierry Philippona, who is Chief Economist at Finance Watch, a Brussels-based NGO working on financial policies in Europe. Uh, welcome, Thierry. We have Lorraine Cook, who's Managing Direct Director at Jigsaw Financial Solutions and member of, Broker of Brokers Ireland Financial Broker Committee. And Lorraine has been doing some very interesting work around capacity building, which we'll talk about today. Welcome, Lorraine. And we have Lydia Del Pozo, Director of Community Investment Programs and responsible for the Global Financial Education Program at BBVA. So I'm really excited to hear about Lydia's perspective and experience on the matter. Welcome, Lydia. And uh, um, we're actually going to be starting uh, with you, uh, going to be starting with you, Lydia. So last for introduction, first for the question. So BBVA has been doing a lot of work, obviously, over the years on building financial literacy and financial education before sustainable finance became a thing. Uh, but now also as sustainable finance is coming high on the agenda. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're doing to improve your customers ability to understand their options? when it comes to sustainable finance and effectively, quote unquote, put their money where their beliefs are? Thank you, Jakob, and thank you to the event organizers for inviting BBVA to participate in this panel. It is an honor for us to be part of the conference. Let me start by saying that two of the BBVA strategic priorities, sustainability and financial health, are completely aligned and linked to today's topic. And, and then from there, I, I will I will explain, um, I will give an answer to your question. At BBVA, we are indeed working to improve the level of financial literacy of our customers regarding sustainability. We recognize the diversity of our clients, retail, business, corporations, but also the different levels of knowledge 
skills and motivations that, that they have in this subject. So this is something that we take into account when we provide financial education in the area of sustainability and sustainable finance. Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, clients with a complete lack of knowledge on the matter. Let aside uh, being familiar with the ESG uh, investing or the taxonomy. For these customers, we need to first create awareness on sustainability, and we do so uh, with tools um, like um, our podcast channel, uh, Sustainable Future, post on our corporate websites, and also uh, sustainability content, uh, key topics and recommendations that we include in our banking app at first level. This allow uh, our customers, our clients, to be aware that products can have uh, environmental and social impact, build their sustainability preferences, and also consider sustainable alternatives to new, to new purchases. A more sophisticated and business-oriented tool uh, is, for example, our greenhouse emission calculator. We, with uh, this functionality um, that we have in our retail app and also we implement in our enterprise transactional website, we try to, we train clients on how to reduce carbon emissions while reducing energy costs and having a positive impact on the planet. In only 12 months, we have reached 2.7 million digital visits to the sustainable section in the retail app, available both in Spain and Mexico. And uh, we have put the carbon footprint calculator of functionality in the hands of more than 125,000 enterprises. Then we have other clients that uh, are knowledgeable of sustainability, but need to improve from basic to experience. For this, we have different training opportunities addressed to gather the learning needs of all kinds of groups. We have uh, general workshops, but also uh, sustainable finance um, specific training on topics such as energy efficiency, for example, for certain uh, sectors like uh, agribusiness, agriculture. We have also some uh, um, training on access to sustainable finance for companies or uh, on the use, for example, of recycled materials. And finally, we have one on one training sessions with corporations that need to become a specialist on, on every subject of, um, of sustainable finance. And for example, we have very specific uh, training on uh, the environmental impact of products the sustainability characteristics of investment products. Speaking in the area of sustainable finance, where taxonomy and other aspects, not least the greenwashing, are quite complex for retail investors. Therefore, financial education is important, but not the, the panacea. So retail investors should, uh, as much as possible, be acquainted with uh, disclosure, labeling, and so on, should be more capable to identify greenwashing. But we cannot put this completely in the shoulders of the retail investors. So this is a typical field where all components, so regulators, industry, issuers, professionals, investors should work together to ensure a smooth development of ACG products market and preserve uh, an effective uh, consumer protection. So this uh, preamble said we are of course conscious that the expected green revolution has uh, already started and we must be ready to oil the wheels to drive this uh, sweet transition to a more sustainable economy. So the interest of retail investor in sustainable products is getting higher and higher. So about that accounts of recent survey on the Italian market, more precisely the report on financial investments of Italian households in 2021 showed that the interest in sustainable investments is rapidly growing especially within some specific targets as women, younger investors, and those with a high level of financial knowledge and digital skills. Although there is still, still some suspicion, skepticism about these, uh, these products, the incentives to sustainable investing are deemed to be significant and mainly related to personal values at the environmental and social impact of the, of the investments. So in my view, survey exercises such as the one just described are quite important to get a first overview of the phenomenon, especially at this early stage of development of the market and knowledge among retail investors, and also to pave the way for more targeted deep dive uh, analysis. So any market flows identified imply the need for regulatory intervention at the European Union is at the forefront as we may 
explore further during the rest of this session. So securities markets authorities are active parts of this process and their role is all but trivial. So let's see specifically about sustainable finance and investor education. That is not, I would say, a traditional relationship. It is something different and new, something that could bring to a situation where it, it would take the form of, I would say, nudging rather than educating due to the attempt of trying to distinguish on our overall sense of uh, sustainability between good uh, and, and bad. So something that would maybe go too far and introduce elements which may impact on the intrinsic uh, neutral nature of educational methodologies and tools which are usually employed to identify investment opportunities, regardless of their typical components in terms of uh, uh, expected yield, uh, risk, time horizon, and so on. Therefore, it's not easy. It's not an easy job for security markets authorities to keep a neutral stance and find the right balance in designing or just endorsing a targeted uh, educational initiative on sustainable finance. The line here between uh, explaining uh, and guiding can be very can be very fine, uh, can be, be very thin. So, moreover, markets authorities might face some challenges along the way concerning high risk associated not only with the many times mentioned greenwashing, but also with the misalignment between market valuation of sustainable investments and their fundamentals, as well as between retail investor expectation objectives and their actual portfolios. So an increased volatility, also about the financial innovation that issuer may implement when design ESG products. So put in a nutshell, a smooth transition to a sustainable finance model should increasingly rely at least for financial supervisor on a proactive and evidence-based approach as much as possible neutral also the financial education space and this is the best way forward i believe so i'll stop here for the moment thanks pascale we um need to get a little bit faster on the answer sorry for i hope i'm not being too forward as a moderator just because we are behind time and uh, i know that we still want to have our lecture but lydia uh, Pascale talked about nudging, um, and that I think sometimes sets off alarm bells because what are you nudging people towards? And especially you, as you know, an organization that is providing the products that you're also educating your customers about at the same time. You know that obviously can also lead people to worry: is this actually something where we, customers are going in the direction that they want? Um, you know, what are your thoughts about um, ways to approach these risks? Do you think that some of the things that Thierry talked about might be solutions here that BBVA would also support and that, that might help, you know, build that trust? Um, yeah, so I, I won't, if I want short answers, I can't ask too many questions, so I'll do that. <laughs> I would be very brief, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's a very timely question and it's not only related to sustainable finance, but to all aspects of financial literacy, as, as you mentioned, and, and Thierry developed. Um, Financial literacy um, and that was discussed before uh, refers to a combination of financial awareness, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors that need to 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 be in a person to in order to make some financial decisions and ultimately achieve that individual financial well-being that we are looking for. Uh, we believe that the information on the product and on the and the training on how to use that product have to be delivering what we call the pitchable moment, which Jerry, Jerry was, was talking before. For us, the most suitable moment to acquire financial literacy is the moment where a person is searching, is comparing, is contracting, or using a product. The goal of, of providing financial literacy in such uh, pitchable moments is to help the client to acquire the information he or she needs to understand the product with its features, but also, and above all, with the risks associated to that product. And only by doing so will the person be able to take that sound and informed decision that we were talking about. Um, this, I think, is particularly important in the field of sustainable finance because it's a topic that is becoming more and more relevant in personal finances. Sustainable finance is giving individuals and business the opportunity to align their financial decisions with their environmental, social and governance preferences. And sustainable finance also increases the complexity of the financial, financial environments. And, and lastly, requires the acquisition of new knowledge 
and obviously attitudes and skills that are necessary to take decisions, uh, sound and good decisions regarding uh, sustainable finance products. In my opinion, the conflict of interest does not does not align or does not exist. Sorry, does not exist uh, when financial services providers give all the relevant information about the product or service that is trying to sell. The incessant um, regulation that we are uh, seeing, like day by day does not help individuals to keep up with the developments of the field of financial, financial uh, sustainable finance. For that reason, financial providers must be transparent and supply all the available information on the products. And in, in relating to sustainable finance, we need to uh, talk about the different products available, the different investment strategies, the sustainable characteristics of the product, the risk associated, the shareholder rights, to to uh, to, to in influencing the financial decisions of a company, so clients can one see how the product is aligned with their sustainability preferences. Two, compare the level of sustainability by using standards, tables, and ratings. And three, and the most obvious reason is to choose the better product for them. Doreen, um, Lydia talked about the word complexity. And that is obviously one of the key challenges we think about sustainable financial literacy because it is adding that extra layer, right? And, and there are two things I think that come to mind. One of them is that, uh, well, if you want to respond to complexity, the best thing to do is just to provide more information that navigates that complexity. But we also know from the lessons from the key information documents that you put a pile of paper in front of somebody and the response is, no, thank you. Um, you know, but then if we don't put a pile of paper in front of it, we see one of the, some things that we see on that we've learned through the My Fair Money platform, for example, that, you know, in the supermarket you can go, I don't want to consume X, I don't want to consume Y. You don't need a PhD to understand that. But in finance, we have this whole group of people that say, I don't want to touch the product if it has coal because I don't like coal and I don't want to touch it. And there's this other group of people that say, I actually am okay investing in coal if it means I'm doing engagement and transitioning the company and that's fine with me. And those are you know, everyone interested in sustainability, but a much more nuanced way to action sustainability than when you're in the supermarket. How do we get people to understand those differences, to process those differences? And what is the right trade-off between the big fat pile of papers that we give everybody and the thousands of hours of educational material and getting to that teachable moment that Lydia talked about um, in terms of making sure people know what they're doing? Yeah, well, if we go back to, to the conflict of interest, firstly, and Lydia touched on this as well, you know, the issue of conflict of interest is dealt with within the EU rules. So we as advisors need to mitigate any conflicts of interest and then the supervisors manage um, those conflicts. Obviously, the world of financial markets and products are very, very complex and they're unpredictable. Um, so this is where the product oversight and governance um, is a great tool in this respect. However, it must be combined with transparency, meaning clear product information. Um, intermediaries and investors must also be able to rely upon that information and documentation that they receive from the product manufacturers to ensure the suitability for the target market that it's designed for. And we look at findings from the uh, 2022 EOPA consumer report. It's very interesting in this regard because the consumers are generally in favor of buying online the types of products that are basic and short term. They don't require any frequent renewals such as motor insurance or general insurance, but they're reluctant to buy online any insurance products that are complex or long term or personalized, usually because the decision making requires more research and reflection from their side. So this is where the role of the professional advisor, the intermediary is key. When it comes to the key information documents, uh, sometimes they can be a barrier because products aren't always comparable and product features need to be clear. In this respect, the ESG and the, the My Fair Money uh, website illustrates this, it requires from the sector and from consumers to become acquainted with the new set of terminology and vocabulary. If people are to move from savings to sustainable investments, they need to be proactively approached. And already it's been mentioned there by Pascal, you know, to be nudged to talk about it and to be invited to talk about it so that it's not intimidating for them. 
So when I'm dealing with my clients, I take great care in my role as the professional advisor to explain the information in a clear and transparent way and to encourage them to ask me questions. Less is more or more is less is also sometimes a problem we have in policy design potentially, right? We see uh, the Sustainable Finance Action Plan. It is also a very thick and heavy agenda. Um, and, you know, it also might be a question of is there enough bandwidth to focus on key issues and, and are all of these really, you know, pointing in the same direction in terms of the goals that we want to achieve. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the questions is are where are we in the area of potentially unintended consequences as well, right? You educate, we'd already talked about nudging and you educate consumers in a certain direction, but there's some evidence that sometimes sustainability funds are more expensive as well. And is that something where their issues arise? Is indeed more information because of more requirements also potentially a burden that may hinder some of the goals that we're working towards? We talked about some of the burdens in the previous panels. So Thierry, pointing to you again, You've already given us your wish list, so you've jumped a little bit the gun, but I'll forgive you. If you tell me now how to prioritize that wish list and where the areas may be where less is more, if such a thing exists in the policy design and the regulatory initiatives for, for the European supervisory authorities. Thank you for your forgiveness. <laughs> Great touch. Shocking <clears throat> um, apart. I like the way you're putting it. The more le is less and less is more. Put it this way, we are where we are. In other words, we have designed, we collectively, a regulation that is not simple and that can challenge a normal, simple, intelligent mind when you tell them that you have a taxonomy of sustainable activities, but under SFDR, you can have dark green financial products that are 0% aligned with the taxonomy of sustainable activities. And the, your normal person is going to say, look, this makes no sense. But we are where we are. So the point is not to regret what has been done. The point is, how do we do best with that? And that goes back, because you asked for my wish list. So I will emphasize on my wish list something which is absolutely crucial, which is the training and the certification of advisors. Because at the end of the day, if you have proper training, good advisors that are also educated for conflicts of interest, um, and in a way, let's give credit to the EU stable finance agenda and to the different pieces of regulation that precisely they have an objective of combating greenwashing, of combating conflict of interest. So in theory, on paper, you apply those regulations and everything or most things will be fine. But in order to do that, you need to have the right people doing it consistently in a systematic manner. And this is where I'm coming back to the training and the certification of advisors, which is absolutely vital because after all, when you think about it, you know, when it comes to selling financial products, every, I hope I'm not saying something wrong, I think every single EU country has a, a, an obligation for advisors to be authorized and certified. Why shouldn't it be the same thing for sustainable finance products? You know, at the end of the day, the ultimate objective of everything we're doing is to say that financial and extra financial, non-financial, sustainable are equally important. Well, if they're equally important, put them on the same footing and therefore request from the people doing the work exactly the same level of competence. Um, and that to me is the least bad solution to a situation we have collectively put in ourselves into, which is far from being optimal. Um, that, that would be my main recommendation, I think. Pascale, turning to you, um, I remember a few years ago reading a study about the obligations of senior military personnel in the United States in terms of trainings, and somebody had worked out that if you did all the trainings properly based on estimated time, it's 250 working days if you did all the trainings in a year. And so obviously the conclusion is people don't do all the trainings, right? But Thierry has obviously, and some of the other panelists have outlined that there is a perceived need to make sure that that capacity is in place. 
Um, what are your thoughts about bringing such capacity online as you look at the agenda? And maybe what are your thoughts about some of the trade-offs around complexity that we've also heard from, from Lydia and Loren, if you have any? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jack. As I said during, I said during my first intervention, drawing on some of the comments from the colleagues, uh, it is uh, I think crucial to count on a kind of multi-level engagement, a commitment by all the players in the in the arena. So whenever conflicts of interest are, rele are relevant in the financial intermediation value chain, as well as complexity is an overall ingredient of an investment decision. I think that independent financial advisors can play a relevant role here. So from one end, they could be able to capture the real expectations, goals of the clients, also in terms of green objectives. On the other hand, they have the professionality and the, and the skills to select financial products, which have a real green content to explain the choices to their clients. So this complemented with an effective, well-regulated ACG writing system and a financial education on the right track might permit a smooth transition to ACG financial products into a sustainable economy. We, of course, need more financial education, more financial literacy, as many studies and researches have reported over the years, and sustainable finance is for sure a topic to be covered is a tool to empower then this ongoing process. This, uh, this can be seen from, from different angles in relation to a wide, wide range of content providers and targets. So in this latter regard, not only retail investors, but also professional and advisors should be educated on sustainable finance as well. So I agree with the theory. So it's a training professionals, uh, as already said, it's, uh, it could be a solution. So also maybe, maybe certification. So Along this line, we're also exploring the topic at the IOSCO C8 level by means of a dedicated WOS stream to sustainable finance and investor education. So in light of the first preliminary feedback received from experts in a targeted literature review, there are some key points around which I reckon a strong consensus is already built up. It would have to weaken the trade-offs mentioned by the colleague just to further confirm previous comments. So financial education, financial literacy should be introduced in the school curricula and started as soon as possible at schools. In Italy, this position is strongly voiced by Professor Anna Maria Usardi, who was already said in the conference earlier, is the director of the Italian Financial Education Committee, of which Consob is a, is a member. So while investor education has already shared, should help to understand taxonomy definition and to read documents, annual reports, and more generally in line with policy objectives to contribute to the transition to a green economy, there is a common feeling that the complexity of the subject and the further complexity to make it easier are substantial challenges. So in this case, to be short, a concise could not work very well. So moreover, as we all know, to improve investor education on a large scale is a long-term achievement, and then it could be not so effective in the short term, whereas the market may be growing exponentially in the coming years. In this regard, maybe, Behavioral, behavioral sciences could help in pointing out the importance of considering the ECG preferences of retail as investor, also when uh, they compile suitability questionnaires. Uh, last, uh, repeated comment from my side is that collecting evidence is always one of the best practices to be performed before taking any, any decision. So among the evidence stemming from the CED World Stream of Sustainable Finance and Investor Education, in particular from the literature review, uh, it came out that the studies addressing the link between investor education, sustainable finance, these cards, and then it is important to stimulate the discussion and, de and debate around the topic. So one of the final objectives of the C the CED World Stream and a final report is expected by the end of June 2022 is to cover some cur current potential gaps, such as to provide with direct real examples, some best practices of investor education initiatives and campaigns on sustainable finance, as well as of uh, procedures and methodologies to conduct financial education on sustainability related issues. So we are just collecting information on these initiatives among our USCO members. So I hope to get to very significant feedback. So I would stop here. Thank you. And I think one of the things that we is not one of the panel panels that we have today is the financial literacy or sustainable financial literacy of supervisory authorities themselves on the topic. And it's really great to see the, the kind of work that you're doing on, on um, kind of educating yourselves basically about the needs and expectations and, and the challenges. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's great also to hear in a moment from from researchers perspective, actually, because uh, 
um, in order for us to make sure we have educated consumers, we need re intelligent regulation, which comes from educated regulators that also have uh, these different perspectives and research insights in mind. We are a little bit behind schedule, as I already mentioned, and my agenda is a little bit uh, jumbled. Apologies to that. But uh, before we go, um, pass the word over to the keynote speech for this panel. We've already had Thierry's uh, Christmas list, and Pascale has, I dare I say, teased it. So maybe I just let Lorraine and Lydia very briefly before we before we pass over to the panel. What's your Christmas list? I know it's Jan, no, it's February now, but still relatively early. But as you know, the earlier you plan your Christmas presents, the better off you are. Lorraine, I'll ask you first. What do you think is needed um, to make sure that we get that uh, the literacy necessary for for consumers to to make the right choices when it comes to sustainable finance? Thanks, Jacob. I think the, um, you know, I look forward to when the framework is completed in relation to the ESG environmental aspects. So, as Thierry uh, spoke about there, you know, for example, the SFDR rules being in place to ensure the products are not marketed as sustainable, which raises concerns over so called greenwashing. So, we need to ensure consumers don't lose trust in these products, especially where the parts are movable. For example, the taxonomy today would identify investments in nuclear energy as sustainable, and in three years' time, it would not be considered as sustainable anymore, which are challenges related to this project, in my opinion. It's again where we need clear product information. It's crucial um, <clears throat> because the requirements and the standards for product manufacturers on how to provide such information should apply at the same time as the intermediary's obligations to integrate the, the customer's sustainability preferences. From a financial performance aspect, uh, this is my opinion is also a challenge for both product manufacturers, investors and intermediaries. The balance is perhaps easier to find where there is a longer term investment horizon rather than the shorter term. But for the shorter term investment horizons, maybe it may, may be an idea to think about tax incentives for sustainable products. The four competence areas that have been put forward by the joint financial competence framework for adults our money and transactions, planning and managing finances, risk and reward and financial landscape. So consumers should be confident to be able to compare standards, labels or ratings, to be aware of sustainable aspects of investment products and to be motivated to follow up with questions uh, to an advisor. This will prevent greenwashing while intermediaries will be there to help consumers make the informed decisions in line with their risk profile, their sustainability preferences and any other preferences that they have. Thanks, Lorraine. And Lydia, to you and, and perhaps also maybe some Christmas wish list, not just to regulators, but also to your peers. What do you think the banking sector needs to do to, to make sure that you drive this forward? Yes, I think... Um... The, the sector has to do some, I think, some actions individually and some actions uh, jointly with other peers. And I would like to see more fin the financial institutions to uh, finding more uh, training opportunities and uh, um, teaching opportunities, not only to uh, specialized investors or corporations, but also to, to retail customers. So um, individually, um, a very useful tool could be to, um, to use the the recently launched uh, financial competence net framework for adults that Lorraine mentioned in, at the beginning of the of the, of the panel. Um, this is a joint initiative of the European Union and the OECD, which has been created under the umbrella of the 2020 Capital Markets Union Action Plan of the Commission. And the framework covers topics uh, related to sustainable finance to as a great tool to identify which competencies need to be built or strengthened in the area. And, uh, and the, the framework includes a very easy, easy to use format, uh, which is a menu of a variety of topics related to finance and, and sustainable finance too, and can be used by banks, by governments, by non-governmental organizations, and even by the educational community. I think Pascal was, was mentioning that before too. And also another to, tool individually uh, that I think uh, financial institutions should be using is something that Thierry uh, mentioned before, the training and the certification of advisors. I totally agree that uh, should be a certification on, on sustainable finance, but in the meanwhile, I think um, uh, financial institutions can, can train their workforce. We, for example, at BBVA have designed a competitive itinerary on sustainable finance uh, with different levels. And for the basic level on sustainability, 
almost 80,000 employees have already uh, completed this first, uh, this first level. And then regarding the sector, what we can do as sectors, uh, two very brief examples. On the one hand, uh, last December, the finance initiative of the UN Environmental Program launched. At, uh, I have to ask to be brief. We are running out of time. So, yeah. so no, that's that's the the commitment on financial health and inclusion. I think almost 30 banks have, have signed it, and it's a commitment to uh, include financial education uh, in the in in the in the operations. The other one is what we can do as a sector. In, within the banking associations locally, and uh, we in Spain have already started a line of work uh, regarding financial education and sustainable finance, and that's all. Thank you. Sorry for rushing you. No. Um, so, Professor Ken Alexander, I feel like I jinxed it by uh, saying your last name first and your last name, uh, your last name first and your first name last, but so apologies, it's all my fault. Um, I have to ask you to be judicious with the time yes, uh, yeah. so that we so we end in, in 15 minutes right and I'll hand the floor over to you. It sounds like the voice is clear and Chris coming through yes. on my side. So right. I see you've already nodded furiously. Feel free to intersperse your presentation with thoughts on what you've heard in the panel today. Uh, but otherwise, I'll, the floor is yours. OK, great. Well, thank you, y Jakob. And, and, and I enjoyed very much the discussion the panelists offered. Uh, excellent insights into some of the uh, practical issues that we confront um, in the area of the sale and distribution of sustainable financial products. And what I wanted to do really was just, uh, I, I just have three or four slides I was going to share with you. Um, and uh, uh, because I know we've got a brief period of time, um, I, I want to focus basically on, uh, first of all, as the panelists know, and many of you in the audience, we have a this new um, legal regulatory framework in the EU governing uh, suitability assessments regarding the distribution of financial products and investment products to uh, to customers, uh, both uh, professional as well as retail. And uh, and of course, uh, your um, this slide here. Uh, what does the suitability and assessment involve? Understanding the financial situation of clients, their their knowledge and experience what their investment objectives are. Uh, and then we might kind of refer to an ESMA guideline statement back in May 2018, in which they said it would be good practice for firms to consider non-financial elements when gathering information on the client's investment objectives and collect information um, on the client's preferences on environmental, social, and governance factors. Now, I think ESMA made that statement back in 2018 when we all felt sustain sustainability was non-financial, and it was sort of a it, it wasn't really financially material. But we know we know now, based on many academic studies, that sustainability risk in the economy are financially material. Many sustainability risks, particularly uh, environmental sustainability risks like uh, uh, climate change, loss of biodiversity, uh, and, and other uh, related environmental risks. Um, and therefore, uh, given that we banks, investment firms, insurance companies selling uh, investment products, all it's incumbent on them to have a know your customer policy uh, to engage with their customers, both retail and professional. And so, so I and I refer to the the, the Mifid delegated regulation and the IDD delegated regulation. Uh, where information on investment objectives should include information on sustainability preferences. Uh, and there should be adequate policies and procedures to understand sustainability factors of financial instruments uh, uh, selected for clients. And that there should be a suitability report that should state how the advice meets the client's sustainability preferences. Now, we heard from some of the panelists, you know, understanding what the preferences is very hard. Uh, you know, we have the, the, the taxonomy, we have different definitions of what green is. Um, and, and but I, I but I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that that doesn't have to be an obstacle because, uh, and again, this is a, again, a, a review of what should be done uh, in, in, the, in the classification of financial products. Uh, the firm needs to decide what products are pursuing sustainable investment objectives, which ones are promoting 
more broader ESG characteristics, and then and, and separate those from just mainstream products. Um, and, and, and so this really requires that the focus is on uh, pre-contractual transparency ESG disclosures that are made on websites, and also ESG disclosures that are made in periodic reports. Now, so, so that brings me to, to what I, my main point in my presentation is that uh, I think that the, the, the suitability assessment that is now required by EU law that we discussed earlier, you know, what are the preferences? What are the attitudes of your customers? There needs to be more engagement by financial firms to know their customers better. And, and I would say it's incumbent on relationship managers, on product advisors, first of all, to provide minimum information on sustainability and sustainability risk to their customers. And then, for example, they should think of innovative ways of engaging in a dialogue with their customers. And we heard our eminent MEP who gave kind of the kickoff talk earlier this afternoon, who said at the point of sale, there should be a point of dialogue. And I would suggest that one way of having a dialogue with your customers is the design of an interactive survey uh, and uh, like a digital interactive survey done within the firm. And, and it could be uh, with the IT department, it could be implemented. And, and I say this because I've just recently overseen and have uh, uh, managed such a survey for UBS, the Swiss bank in Switzerland. Uh, about a year ago, uh, UBS was concerned that they did not know their customers' preferences and attitudes and objectives regarding sustainability risk. And because Swiss law is changing this year to require that banks like UBS and other banks in Switzerland to conduct suitability assessments regarding sustainability preferences, um, UBS decided to kind of uh, uh, take the initiative on this and start about a year ago to try to understand what their clients' motivations are regarding sustainable finance. And so, and so I led a, a research team at the University of Zurich that worked with UBS, and we designed a, a survey, uh, a, a digital survey that was dis disseminated to all their uh, to not all of their retail clients, but many of their private wealth management clients to understand what their what their preferences were, their attitudes and their objectives regarding sustainable finance. And so and so you might say, well, who participated in the survey? It consisted of the trustees of private pension funds, uh, representatives of public pension funds, uh, foundations, uh, um, uh, insur uh, companies, uh, private banks, family offices, uh, uh, both uh, private wealth management, high net worth individuals, but also some retail customers. UBS in Switzerland is a retail bank, a big retail bank. And so we collected uh, responses from them about, we asked them questions about what part of sustainability do you care about? Are you concerned about carbon? Are you concerned about the loss of biodiversity? Are you concerned about social sustainability? Are you, are you concerned about child labor? Are you concerned about companies having diverse boards of directors. And we got back numerous, we, we got back over 5,000 responses, a variety of ways that we've collated the data. We're publishing our report next month, so I can't really reveal the, I, the report, but I can give you uh, some hint uh, as to what some of the motivations were regarding some of the respondents. And many of the respondents felt that they had a legal duty uh, or fiduciary duty to consider sustainable financial products. Uh, for their for their clients, and also uh, that many felt that there were re that regulation was changing to require that they take into account sustainability, uh, and also uh, other, uh, especially for companies, they wanted to be seen uh, as as being investing in sustainable products as part of their business reputation, and and then some had more practical. Uh, so, uh, uh, said it reduces overall, 71% of the respondents said it reduces overall portfolio risk. And then 60% and then said it's beneficial for investment returns. And then, and what I thought was most interesting, at least for this panel, is that of, of the respondents, 44% um, answered the question, what are the major obstacles to ESG sustainability uh, 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 investing? And 44% said inadequate certification of sustainable assets. Uh, the second highest obstacle was 
insufficient disclosure about the risk of sustainable investing. Um, and 36% said lack of adequate passive sustainable investment approaches. Uh, and 33% said insufficient information about sustainable investing is offered. And then finally, 28% said sustainable assets are not transparent enough. So these were considered to be the top five obstacles for the respondents regarding why they have not yet invested in sustainable products. So, so, so I, I showed this as, as just an example of how one bank, UBS, was able to reach out to their customer base and to collect a lot of information that was meaningful information that has helped them uh, understand their, their clients better regarding their attitudes and preferences and objectives towards sustainability risk. And, and I would suggest you know, this is not you new know, doing surveys is not a panacea. It's not going to fix the problem. It needs to be part of a broader framework. As earlier panelists pointed out, advisors need to be trained adequately. Conflicts of interest need to be policed. These are things that supervisors can oversee. But ultimately, I see this issue as being more of a corporate governance issue. It's an issue where financial firms themselves have a duty to under to understand what how sustainable finance sus sustainability risk affect the financial uh, objectives of their customers. And so this sh should be something that the board should be addressing right now. And then, and I might just add uh, one follow-up in that in the UK now, in the United Kingdom, of course, you know, Britain has, has left the EU and the UK has adopted almost all of the sustainable action finance plan that's going to be implemented in the UK law. But, but one interesting area where the UK did on corporate governance is they require all financial firms to appoint a non-executive director who is designated to be responsible for sustainable finance. And it's his or her opportunity, uh, duty to understand how is the firm managing sustainability risk? How are they reaching out to customers to understand what their attitudes and preferences are regarding sustainable finance? And, and I think, and so right at the board level, the board and, and all regulated UK financial institutions has now a NED, a, a non-executive director who has this responsibility. And, and I don't think the EU has that requirement. Um, and, and I think that, so I think there's, there's something that can be said for, we need to focus on governance, the governance of financial institutions. I don't think more prescriptive regulation, I don't think more KID documents are, are, are really the solution here. It's really creating incentives for financial firms to know their customers better. And surveys are one way of doing this. So now here in Switzerland, I'm doing an, a number of surveys for other, for insurance companies and also some smaller mid-sized banks, similar to the UBS survey that we did. So anyway, I just wanna promote the idea of good corporate governance involving the board and, and working with the regulator in an interactive way, but really the initiative has gotta come from the financial firm. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you also for staying on time. That's uh, really great to see. Uh, although I regret not hearing more, and I think uh, we all regret not having the study to peruse. Uh, where can we, maybe just one question, where can we find the study when it's out? And when is it out so people know where to find it when it's ready? It's it's coming out on March 5th, and uh, and I will it will be publicly disseminated. It will be uh, on my slides I sent, I, I have the www.sesfin.ch website. That's our research network for sustainable finance. It's broad based with academics and practitioners. It will be published on that website, the sesfin.ch website. It, it will also be public, UBS will disseminate it on their company website and they'll do a press conference here in Zurich on it. So there will be some local media here in Switzerland about it. Um, however, I'll be disseminating it uh, in, in academic forums at conferences, and it will be on the www.sesfin.ch website. All right. So, and, uh, and, and so March 5th is the release date. So, so thanks very much for asking. Thank you. All right, perfect. Everyone knows, and there's plenty of links in the chats as well. Um, so I'm also, so if you're interested in more information about this topic, you can go on sosfin.ch, you can go on some of the links that we've posted or a lot of the links that we've posted. The ASAs are also going to be making material available on their website, letting attendees know about some of this. So that's really great to hear. And, uh, and you can see, obviously, peruse some of this material that you saw in the chat. If you don't see that, this chat pane may be hidden for some of you. 
Uh, and so you can pop that out and you're going to need to do that now anyway, because we're getting to the final part of our session where we're asking you to vote because this is a democracy, right? <laughs> and so everyone gets to vote. In the previous session, we had a lot of um, non-voting, which is unfortunately the majority. I hope we don't have the case. So if I could ask the colleagues from to pull up the poll questions, thank you. So that poll is now live. We have a minute, so don't waste your time. I'll read it out for you. And if you can't see it, please pop out your chat pane. Would the primary focus of enhancing consumers' financial education on sustainable finance, in your view, be on? Select one of the answer. And the question is primary. Everything is important, perhaps. But what is the primary focus? Is it A, lifelong awareness and educational tools? B, advisor's role to support the consumers at point of sale? Or C, financial institutions and private sectors communication adjusting the consumer's need? And as you're aware, whatever you will answer now will be implemented immediately by the ASA. So make sure that you take your vote seriously. Um, that's not uh, the formal position, by the way, that I'm representing here. But please answer the poll. And we just have a few seconds left, I see. So make sure you do that now. Polling has ended. Now I imagine we will be able to see the results. Here we go. All right, that's a pretty decent um, uh, participation rate. That's not too bad. So, and we can also say something, lifelong awareness is critical. So, Loren, a lot of focus on the work that you're doing starting, but lifelong awareness doesn't stop once people graduate from high school. And it's been such a pleasure to hear about all the different initiatives from the panelists today, whether it's in schools, whether it's the continuous engagement that uh, banks like BBVA doing, uh, whether it's the, the support from NGOs and making sure that the certification is there, as Thierry talked about, and whether it's just to see the capacity building and the focus that uh, European supervisors and the regulatory community is putting on the topic. And, and not the least, having this conversation, I, I think, today is testament to that effect. We are just two minutes before time, but I'm going to do the unorthodox and finish a little bit early, not because I don't have more questions, but I think it's a nice little change of pace. So I just want to say again, a final thank you to all the panelists today. It's been such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. A special thanks to Kern Alexander for your patience in moving in being moved around in the agenda today. And thank you for taking the time to tell us a little bit about some of your projects. We all look, really look forward to reading the report. All that is uh, left for me to say is to also thank, in particular, the staff that is at ESA that has been at the ESA that has been supporting me uh, in making sure this has all been perfectly choreographed and planned. So thank you very much for making this such a smooth experience. And uh, it suffice it to say, I now have the privilege of handing over to Petra Vilkema, who is the chairperson of IOPA and the chairperson of the ESA Joint Committee and stay friends as we talk about sustainable finance moving forward. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Jakob. Um, thank you uh, also, Professor Alexander, and, and thank you panelists uh, very much. Uh, and uh, I see many people applauding, and I think that is one of the things we really miss uh, when we have virtual meeting, but uh, the alternative is great. So uh, I think, uh, a very, very serious applause, but mostly thank you for a very rich discussion. And um, it's one thing when you plan a conference and you you list the topics and you you hope for a certain discussion. But for me, each panel and also this panel um, was so much more than what I hoped for uh, with uh, a lot of information shared. I, I think so much passion also for this topic and, and I share that. Uh, but also in the chat, all the links that were shared and the information that is out there that can all also help us and that we can benefit uh, uh, our work. So thank you very much for sharing that um, and uh, for your participation today. And that brings us indeed to the end of our conference. But before I close, I would like to take a, a few moments of your time to reflect on what we've been doing in the past two days. Um, only yesterday we started and uh, at the opening of the conference we heard 
from Her Majesty Queen Maxima, who stressed that good financial health should be the desired outcome of financial education and literacy um, to enhance people's financial planning and saving habits, and particularly the vulnerable, vulnerable ones. And I think uh, that came back uh, also today uh, with some of the speakers, the need to really focus on that group. Um, we also he heard, of course, from Commissioner McGuinness, um, who underlined the importance of equipping people uh, with the skills and the knowledge to take informed decisions about their finances. And again, had that, that was heard today as well, and, and also the need for a lifelong learning. And I think the last poll actually showed that, that we feel that that indeed is, uh, is at least a priority among all the other topics that are important. Um, I was very happy to also hear Flora and Messi uh, present on the recently launched financial competence framework developed there with the OECD International Network on Financial Education and the Commission that can very much help improve financial skills throughout Europe. And I think that we can all agree that while financial literacy has always been important, it is all so much more important in the face of digital transformation that is accelerating um, and something we discussed indeed in the second panel where we discussed the challenges that financial institutions and public authorities face, but also consumers, of course, when dealing with all these new tools and understanding what is actually offered. Now, this morning, um, uh, Stephanie Jong-Cortin, a member from European Parliament, underlined the need to empower citizens to become active consumers for financial products. And again, that sentiment featured, I guess, through both of the panels of today, where we first looked at how to empower the vulnerable groups, but all and to move to a more inclusive society, and then indeed discussed how financial education can play a role in a green transition, but also how um, the products that we are now offered are actually products that are also being bought because people can understand them and trust them. And I think that all just underlines why we need to take the topic of financial literacy and financial education very seriously. And Commissioner McGinn has said it, low levels of financial skills impact negatively on individuals and families, um, and thereby also on the economy. What is clear is that financial education is not just only about school. I think that is that came out very clear of both of the days. And it also is not only about educating. It's a lifelong learning adventure that does stop when you turn 18. Um, and so I would say it's very much about engaging people, about empowering people. And um, just now uh, looking at the presentation of uh, Professor Alexander and, and hearing about and financial institution that is really looking into uh, uh, what is the customer's need. I think that hopefully will help because if the need also is more financial education and less complex products, let's listen to that and let's work on that. Now, as I said at the beginning of the conference, financial literacy is more than being able to read a financial statement. It's about having an overview of your own financial situation. It's about knowing and also being able to withstand unforeseen shocks that happen to everyone. Um, and the shocks take different forms. Uh, you can lose a job and that might be more serious than maybe have your car break down, but some people have a car breaking down, cannot repair it and then lose their job. So I think all is relevant. Now, to help people understand the bigger picture and to make better decisions on how to save, what policies are needed and where to invest can help financial stability, I would say, in the long run. Creating economically independent citizens who are able to stand on their own feet will benefit the economy. And for us as European supervisory authorities, increasing knowledge and engaging and empowering consumers all fall within the consumer protection mandate. And examples of our work include the interactive maps that provide consumers with information on how to access financial education initiative in their own country. Um, and we also published um, soon a, a thematic repository financial education initiative from across the European Union. So uh, feel free to go to one of our websites and find information on what education initiatives are out there 
uh, in each member state because we try to collect them and also publish them in a report. And we will do so also later this year, um, doing a joint ASA thematic report on initiatives across, uh, across the European Union. So we're working independently as well as together, and I can assure you that we will continue to build on financial education work to foster more financial resilience and inclusive societies. And finally, before I close, and this is really an important part of what I wanted to say in the afternoon, is I would like to thank all the speakers and all the panelists for bringing such an engaging debate to, for the last two days. And moreover, I would like to follow Jacob and say that I very much want to thank all the colleagues in all the three supervisory authorities for getting this organized, for working so hard behind the scenes, be it on the program, be it at supporting panels, be it at making sure technology works. Thank you so much for making this conference happen. It was a first conference on financial education and literacy, and we can see by the interest in the topic and the quality of the discussion that it should not be our last. And so with that, I want to close and thank you, the public, the audience, for being there, for participating. And I truly hope that Verena next year and then after that, Jose Manuel, when they take on the chairmanship of the three ASAS, will be welcoming you back for yet another conference on this important topic. For as Her Majesty Queen Maxima said in her remarks, let us identify good practices, share the ideas, join forces, and I might add to that, and then act. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. See you next year. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much.